Buenos dias. We're going to get started in, in just a minute. I want to make sure everyone can just take their seats. We're good? Yep. Buenos dias, everyone. Really excited that you are all here today at the City Council Chambers. My name is Carlos Manchaca, New York City Council uh, Chair of the Task Force of the BQX, and I am pleased to welcome uh, all of you here today. This is the first public hearing at the New York City Council through this task force on the proposed Brooklyn Queens connector, as you all know and have stickers, some of you, on your chests called the BQX. The task force on the BQX was formed by Speaker Johnson and myself to shed light on the planning process for the proposed streetcar system and to provide a venue for public feedback on this project. We're gonna hear a lot about origin stories today and I think this is a really important point to make in the origin story of this task force that really what, what I wanted to do, and the speaker has been so strong on transportation and really making sure that the voices of the people were heard when we think about transportation citywide, is to actually look at this corridor and understand the transportation needs along this corridor from the people themselves. And that's what we're gonna be hearing today. Uh, we will hear that testimony from you and the city agencies who will be presenting today um, who have been most involved in the planning process for the BQX, the New York City Economic Development Corporation and the New York City Department of Transportation. They will both be here today testifying. We also look forward to the public testimony from those who have been involved in the planning process thus far, transit experts, as well as the residents who will be mostly affected by the proposed project. A project of this scale, a permanent reallocation of public streets along the Brooklyn and Queens waterfront requires both the expert knowledge of engineers and planners and the intimate knowledge of local stakeholders about their community. This hearing should be an opportunity for residents to learn more about the proposal and how they can be more involved in the planning process. Civic engagement, civic engagement. This hearing is also an opportunity for decision makers, including the city agencies here today, and my fellow council members along the corridors, the corridor, to hear from their constituents about what matters most to them along this corridor as we look at the transportation needs. The proposed 11-mile route affects many of the waterfront communities between Red Hook and Astoria. And I will say that Sunset Park was once part of the BQX proposal and is no longer there, but still remains as part of the conversation as a need for transportation along this corridor. Residents want answers to how this proposal will affect their daily lives and what changes they should expect with the introduction to the BQX in their own communities. I expect many people from the public to voice their support or their opposi opposition of the, po of the project today. But above all else, I hope that there's an opportunity for everyone to leave here today with the facts of the proposal themselves. And I'll repeat that. I want everyone to leave with a sense of the facts of the proposal being discussed today. The agencies are here to today to provide, one, a rationale for the proposed streetcar system in this portion of the waterfront, two, the most up-to-date status of the planning process for the BQX, and three, how has the proposal changed during the community engagement process? There is a long road between now and the eventual vote by the City Council on this project, that's for sure. But the information we gather here today from the agencies and the feedback provided by the public will help us here at the City Council to inform our own deliberations about this ULERP process that is on its way. I want to thank EDC 
and DOT pro to provide, who are providing testimony today, and all the committee members that I'll name later uh, in, the, in the process, and, and thank all the members of the City Council who are here today. Uh, Jimmy Van Bramer from Queens, Antonio Reynoso was here, he'll pop back in. He's, there's another transportation hearing happening over there on the other side. And again, I wanna say thank you to all for being here. I hope you leave being heard. We have a lot of people who are testifying, so we're gonna to move to the clock so we can get a sense of your testimony today. And the first, uh, we're gonna actually move to directly to the administration. Uh, we can get the administration on for the first panel. We will be asking for Mr. Seth Myers from EDC, Will Fisher, EDC, Rebecca Zach from the DOT, and Chris Hones from the DOT. Please make your way up. And we're gonna swear you in first. Hey Chris, good to see you. Would you all please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? You may begin your testimony. Make sure that the red light is on, Seth. Thank you. That's much better. It. The red light okay. helps. You, you should Thank re you. We should repeat the first. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, <laughs> or buenos dias. Um, Chairman Jaka, council member Van Bramer, uh, members of the BQX task force. My name is Seth Myers, and I'm an executive vice president and director of project implementation at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, or EDC. Uh, I am pleased to testify before you on the Brooklyn Queens Connector, or BQX, streetcar project. I'm joined today by my colleague, Will Fisher. He's a senior project manager on EDC's government and community relations team, and our colleagues at the Department of Transportation, Rebecca Zach, assistant commissioner for intergovernmental affairs, and Chris Rones, director of strategic transit initiatives. New York City is known for its unique and successful combination of mixed-use communities, walkable streets, great public spaces, premier cultural and educational institutions, and job centers, including the Financial District or Midtown Manhattan. Much of its notable success is directly attributed to past investments in transportation, most of which were Manhattan-focused and helped support the city's evolution over the past century. New York City also has a long history of embracing innovative transportation technology from the steam-powered ferry to elevated trains to a network of cutting-edge bridges and tunnels and one of the world's most extensive subway systems. These infrastructure innovations continue to be the backbone of the city's economy. They fuel economic growth, connect neighborhoods, and create opportunities where none had existed. It is indisputable that today's economically thriving New York City would not exist without this vast, multifaceted, and complex mass transit system. But it is critical to note that there remain serious gaps in connectivity. While the current bus networks help link gaps in subway service and other new forms of transit like City Bike or NYC Ferry have been implemented, there are certainly more we can do to invest in transit infrastructure. We must continue to close these gaps for the city's continued development and commuting needs. Manhattan remains the single largest employment hub in the region, yet an increasing number of businesses and residents are opting to set up shop or live in neighborhoods in the other four boroughs. This presents both an immediate need and unprecedented opportunity to develop new modes of transit that are cost-effective, efficient, and inclusive. Every day, EDC works on projects with the goal of making the city fairer today and stronger tomorrow. Aligning economic development with the city's overall mass transportation network is a critical strategy to accomplish this goal. That is why we believe in making strategic new investments that reflect the economic realities of today and the years to come, and not the 100 years prior. For over a century, the MTA subway system has functioned as the lifeblood of the city by ensuring New Yorkers could get from point to point. While our subway was designed to support a Manhattan-centric economy, thriving new residential and economic hubs have developed across the city. And this, and this growth can be acutely seen along the Brooklyn-Queens waterfront. This fast-growing corridor is home to 300,000 jobs and over 400,000 residents, including nearly 40,000 New Yorkers living in public housing. As these numbers continue to grow and as new job centers emerge in the outer boroughs, the city must prepare to accommodate this growth responsibly and equitably. Recognizing the value of connecting over a dozen waterfront neighborhoods along the Brooklyn-Queens waterfront 
the de Blasio administration has made important investments in transit options that better link these communities to each other and to the rest of the city. Just last year, EDC completed implementation of the NYC ferry system to neighborhoods with few existing transit options. These include Western Astoria, Red Hook, and Long Island City. And earlier this month, we launched a new route to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, an emerging job center. Stretching from the Rockaways to the East Bronx, our waterborne transit system has already served close to nine million riders. Like NYC Ferry, the Brooklyn Queens Connector is intended to stitch together the gaps left by the subway system, prioritizing connections within and between boroughs outside of Manhattan, and improve commuting options for residents. This proposed state-of-the-art zero-emission streetcar will run 11 miles from Astoria through downtown Brooklyn and ultimately to Red Hook. It will connect dozens of diverse neighborhoods across 13 subway routes, over 30 bus lines, 10 ferry landings, and dozens of city bike stations. For residents along its route, it will be a game-changing mode of transportation. In addition, the BQX's presence is expected to generate over $30 billion in economic uh, benefits over 40 years, indicating a strong return on its investment. This investment equates to greater neighborhood connectivity and increased integration with the existing public transit system. This will in turn boost access to the many parks, academic institutions, job opportunities, and cultural centers within the evolving corridor. Moreover, the BQX has the potential to re reduce average commutes by as much as 14 minutes at full build-out. That means that New Yorkers will, have, will spend less time stuck in traffic and tunnels and more with friends and family. Since the proposed BQX streetcar was announced in 2016, EDC and the Department of Transportation have been hard at work studying critical elements such as infrastructure, feasibility, design, construction, all needed to bring it to life. Simultaneously, we have been in continuous conversations with New Yorkers about this new mode of transit. We have had more than 150 engagement touch points that yielded indispensable feedback and we look forward to more engagement in the very near future. Our collective work informed a conceptual design report released last summer, which represents approximately 5% of the overall project design. This report details engineering and design feasibility, potential impacts on communities, cost of construction, and the economic benefits that the BQX stands to deliver. Following the completion of the study, our current estimate of the project cost is $2.7 billion. Approximately half of the capital budget, $1.3 billion, would be generated through a financing strategy called value capture. Value capture is a mechanism that dedicates a portion of the modest increase in property tax revenue collected brought about by the infrastructure improvements to pay for those investments. Regarding the additional funding need, the city anticipates pursuing federal funding for the project and we are following all the requisite processes to make this a qualifying and competitive project. Starting this fall, New Yorkers will continue to have additional opportunities to provide input on the BQX and help further define the project's development. Over the next year, the city, in partnership with our engineering consultant, VHB, will complete an environmental review, which will examine impacts and potential mitigations, as well as alternatives to the project, such as bus rapid transit, or BRT. Additionally, the work will further analyze project delivery methods, such as the design build process, in addition to operations, implementation, and phasing. While we understand the critical need for investment in the city's current transit system, we also need to prioritize proactive planning for our growing population and future generations of New Yorkers. It is imperative that we take action to diversify transit modes today to strengthen the city's economy tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. My colleagues from DOT will now provide their testimony, after which we are happy to take questions. Good morning, Chairman Chaka. Good morning, Council Member Von Bramer. My name is Christopher Rones. I'm Director of Strategic Transit Initiatives for the DOT. <clears throat> I'm joined today by Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack, to my left. And we are honored to be here on behalf of Commissioner Trottenberg, together with our colleagues from EDC, to provide this testimony and address your questions as they may relate to DOT's supporting role in this BQX project. DOT has been assisting EDC with the planning and conceptual design of the BQX. We are excited to be part of this project that would on the one hand offer improved mobility and access for thousands of New Yorkers and on the other hand provide additional opportunities to transform our streets, not only prioritizing transit but also making them work better for bicyclists, pedestrians and other users. With a rapid surface transit investment in this corridor, the city would complement many of DOT's key initiatives, including Vision Zero and our recently initiated Better Buses Action Plan. 
DOT has been working and will continue to work with EDC on determining how the BQX would fit into and function within a constrained urban street environment. We view the development of a major rapid transit service along this corridor as not only a challenge, but also an opportunity to re-envision how our streets in these neighborhoods can be transformed into spaces that prioritize transit, pedestrians, and bicyclists over automobiles. DOT continues to innovate in our street management approach by implementing new designs that make walking, biking, and using transit safer and more efficient. And we're currently in the process of implementing a few types of new designs that would, we would build upon in this BQX project. These include, on the one hand, shared streets. Secondly, projects that limit or restrict traffic, such as our pilot truck and transit priority treatment on 14th Street. And third, physically protected transit lanes that we will be piloting this year with, two miles of, with up to two miles of bus lanes um, in planning. The BQX would involve extensive application of these approaches along a densely populated 11-mile corridor. With the currently proposed BQX alignment, DOT and EDC would provide direct routing between major destinations and a high level of transit priority, while also maintaining the functionality and safety of the streets on which it runs. We have had great success on many corridors around the city, reconfiguring our roadways to provide more space for pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit, and improve safety for all users. Indeed, this is one of the primary ways in which we have been able to make serious injuries, to reduce serious injuries and fatalities and make progress towards Vision Zero. We would integrate many of our key Vision Zero tools that we employ to reduce fatalities and serious injuries into the BQX project. These include sidewalk extensions and medians, traffic calming through lane reduction and limiting of through traffic. New transit stations themselves would decrease pedestrian crossing distance, either by expanding sidewalks or creating accessible median refuges. Replacing general traffic lanes with dedicated streetcar lanes would have a traffic calming effect. Finally, with some of the proposed street designs, we would discourage cut-through traffic, resulting in lower traffic volumes and speeds, particularly on residential streets. Calming traffic also improves bicycle safety. As the project progresses, we will develop more detailed bicycle designs that ensure that bicyclists can safely negotiate in-street tracks, as they do in many North American cities and around the world. Although a streetcar would be an unfamiliar mode for many New Yorkers and require some adjustment, we believe the project would contribute to the overall safety of our streets. In addition to cutting edge street design, BQX would require innovative curb management. The BQX serves multiple commercial corridors which would continue to have goods and passenger loading needs. Building on existing DOT programs, we look forward to continuing to work with local business communities on innovative approaches such as off-hour deliveries, loading on cross streets, and even bicycle delivery programs. At DOT, we are currently stepping up our efforts to improve bus service in New York City. Our Better Buses Action Plan aims to speed up buses by 25% by 2020 and increase reliability. We will accomplish this through various forms of transit priority treatments, dedicated additional enforcement, and by coordinating our efforts with MTA's borough bus network redesigns, which will reconfigure bus routes in an effort to improve service and reverse negative bus ridership trends. With BQX, the city would provide an important addition to surface transit in key sections of Queens and Brooklyn and complement an improved bus network. The BQX would neither merely replace bus routes nor run in totally independently of them. Instead, we are committed in the future to integrating the new service with buses and subways in a way that fully optimizes transit in this part of the city. And of course, fair integration with MTA, which including free transfers, would also be an essential component of making the BQX a success. In conclusion, the BQX is an innovative, forward-looking transportation investment in a key growth corridor that would improve mobility for thousands of New Yorkers. The project would advance DOT's mission to provide for the safe, efficient, and environmentally responsible movement of people and goods in the city of New York. We look forward to continuing to support EDC in this project. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank you both for your testimony. Uh, we have two members of the council that I want to uh, recognize for questions. I'm going I'm to start with a few questions before I go through my, my list. Uh, to respect, I know there's a few hearings today, and I want to make sure that they can get their questions in. But I'm going to start with the origin uh, and cost of the BQX concept, as, as was proposed. And what I really want to understand is, what, what was the origin and the concept for the light rail along this corridor, this specific corridor, and what agencies and non-governmental partners were initially consulted to birth this concept and idea? Can you walk through that a little bit? Uh, sure, thank you, Council Member. Um, you know, I think we, we have long looked at, as, as well as our colleagues at DOT, areas of the city that are, um, you know, underserved by transit and would benefit by better connections. Uh, that's in part why we launched initiatives like NYC Ferry to better connect a lot of these waterfront neighborhoods, uh, both with each other and with other job centers, uh, including Manhattan, uh, or like Sunset Park or Brooklyn Navy Yard, where we're looking to support uh, industrial jobs and quality neighborhoods there. Um, particular to the streetcar, there was a group of both community and um, you know local owners and residents along the alignment that grouped together and uh, came up with a, a proposal for this uh, the streetcar notion. It was something that was discussed with, with City Hall and uh, Deputy Mayor Glenn. And then uh, EDC was asked, along with, with DOT, to help evaluate this for its feasibility. Um, we took a look at it and over um, you know, several months' time said that there were portions of the proposal that made a lot of sense and helped um, in alignment with our goals bridge some of those existing transit gaps and, and help better connect those communities. And there were other parts of it that, um, that we didn't think were feasible and required some modifications and, and um, you know, whether that's analysis around ridership or cost or that's specific to the actual alignment and streets that they chose to, to run the, uh, the streetcar along and made a series of significant modifications to the proposal uh, that results in kind of what you have today. Do you have any sense of timeline on when the city first started working on the BQX and the proposal? Uh, Council Member, I, I believe it was in 2016 that okay. we, we first started working on this with our, our first, uh, what we called the rapid assessment phase. Okay, and just so I could get a, a sense of, of it, I, I, I'm kind of hearing two different pieces, and this is all important, this is gonna kind of build into a larger kind of narrative here, but what, what I'm looking for are are different pieces that kind of started the questions about the corridor itself and the needs, and you, you, sp you speak a lot to the needs. Are there, are there specific moments that came out of studies that showed need, high need here in this corridor? And can you point to those studies? And, and maybe this is more of a DOT question for transportation, but I'm looking to, to that and when that kind of started the conversation, or was the BQX concept really uh, an offering of this group that you mentioned? It's an excellent question, Council Member, and if I could just continue first and then I'll happy, happily yield to my DOT colleagues. You know, we look at, at jobs and economic growth and residential growth, and this is one of the fastest growing corridors in the city. We've seen uh, enormous uh, development, we've seen enormous growth and um, emerging job centers and hubs uh, as people choose to locate their businesses, whether that's larger or smaller in these areas. Um, that's exactly the type of analysis that we did that concluded that we needed a very robust expansion of the ferry network here. And, um, and, and so in, in terms of meeting those goals for connections, that's very much in line with what we had you know, for, for the longer term been planning. Yeah, I would just add that from, a, from our perspective, I mean, I think we're on the same page with EDC about this being sort of a unique corridor that's growing fast, that we expect to grow in the future um, that doesn't have great existing transit connections all along the corridor. Um, in terms of like some of the studies we've done in determining SBS routes, for instance, um, we tend to focus more on um, you know, a number of factors, but one of the big things is existing ridership, looking, you know, obviously working with MTA on that project, looking at what are their bus routes that have high ridership, um, that have continuous corridors with the potential to, um, you know, in a fairly short order, put in some meaningful bus priority corridors, uh, bus priority measures. The BQX corridor, I'd say, is a little bit of a different beast. Um, it's a little less continuous. Um, you know, this project is a little bit of a different approach. It's looking more towards the future as opposed to addressing existing capacity issues. So that's kind of where we come at it from. 
Okay, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wait for some, there's some juicy stuff that we're gonna unpack later, but I'm gonna stay on costs here. Uh, has the administration hired consultants uh, in this time since 2016 that were directly connected to the BQX proposal? If you can kind of give us a sense of, of those consultants, the costs and the price, I wanna get a sense of how much was spent thus far uh, on the BQX with consultants. And then on the other side, any kind of in-house costs for people on team, if, if that's been measured at all, both from DOT and from EDC. Thank you, Council Member. Um, we have uh, we've spent uh, a, a good deal of time taking a look at both the feasibility of the initial proposal, kind of making it our own, if you will, making those modifications I talked about, and then um, developing more details around both the ridership, the financial, and cost models uh, involved with the project. Um, over the three phases of work, which would be the initial assessment, a phase one and a phase uh, two, uh, which resulted in the, the August uh, report that we put out last summer, um, we've spent about seven and a half million dollars to date. Um, and that's using a series of outside consultants um, around engineering studies, transit analysis, ridership analysis, um, doing some of the detailed cost estimates as well as the financial uh, and growth modeling. And, uh, and, and I would just add, Council Member, that, um, that those were uh, funded by EDC self funds, uh, not from city capital or another source like that. Wait, can you, I'm sorry, you, can you repeat that one more time? Uh, those are what? Um, so it's a, a funding source called EDC self funds. Uh, so the, the, the funding allocated there, the 7.4 million that, that, that Seth referred to is, is not coming out of the, uh, not coming out of the city, city council budget. Got it. Got it, so this is self, EDC. It's the corporation's funds. Owns, owns, corporation owns funds. funds, and these are essentially the revenues that you collect from the, all the properties that you have within the EDC portfolio? Correct. Okay, and that's EDC's size, 7.5 million. Mm -hmm. And then can DOT talk a little bit about your, your costs on your side? Sure, our costs would be, uh, would be solely um, staff costs. Um, I don't have a figure in front of me. I will say that at this moment we have myself um, pretty much fully devoted to the project and then we bring in other staff as needed um, to work on the project. Um, and I think, you know, probably having that pattern has consist had persisted since the project started with different people. Um, and I can certainly get you the figures mm -hmm. in terms of the actual cost breakdown if you'd like them, but yes, staff-based. Yeah. And, and, um, and on the EDC side as well, a breakdown of the 7.4, if, if that's something you can get within the hearing, it'd be great, but uh, a breakdown of the 7.4. 7 I know there was a higher, hired consultant that came in from Canada maybe, uh, so there's other folks, if you can kind of do a line item, that'd be great to kind of just see the, the infrastructure. We want to get a sense of the infrastructure. Yep. And it sounds like, and you got it, okay. You see if you can get it. Awesome, great. I'm gonna pause my cost questions and then hand it over to Councilmember Reynoso for a first set of questions with a clock of three minutes. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, I wanna ask more general questions um, because I think um, a lot of the concern that folks have related to this project, if they have any concerns, are, are, are very basic qu um, questions that need answers. Um, a lot of folks are concerned about the cost of what a BQX project uh, would amount to. I think it's three, mil three billion dollars at this moment, and how we would get that money in the city to actually build this out. The timeline by which this would be built is another concern. Um, and then the last one is alternatives. A lot of folks uh, believe that if the Department of the uh, DOT decided they wanted to uh, build out a SBS system with a dedicated route for buses, the same way we would take streets on for the BQX, removing parking, and just allowing for there to be an express uh, uh, SBS. Um, that could be an alternative that's more short-term um, and, and more cost-effective. Uh, uh, so we, can you just talk to me about how much you think this project would cost, um, how you would get the financing for it, and why a SBS alternative, for example, would be something that you don't believe um, uh, can, can do the same thing. Um, there, thank you. Uh, Council Member, thank you for the question. It's an important one to, to go through. Um, 
if, if it's all right with you, I'll, I'll try to take a shot at answering your questions around the cost of the project and how we arrived at that figure, uh, the mechanism that we propose to pay for it, and then I'll ask my DOT colleagues to talk a little bit more about SBS as it relates to options to address bridging some of these gaps. And before, before you start, because I only have three minutes, so I want to ask, I just want to say one thing is that I'm, I represent Williamsburg, uh, portion of the route here. We're going to see an increase in population of over 100,000 people, I believe, within the next three years, um, according to the 2005-2006 rezoning, they said it was um, uh, a significant increase in the North Brooklyn area. Uh, we have a very limited amount of transportation in the waterfront. Uh, as you can see, the ferries, which I think are oversubsidized, are a big problem for me, but even the ferries uh, this weekend, uh, folks are waiting one hour to be able to move to, let's say, uh, Far Rockaway to go to the beach and, and so forth. Um, the L train, you have to wait for three trains uh, or three, uh, yeah, trains um, before you can get on the L train during rush hour going and coming. Um, it's, not, it's not a convenient route. The G train um, is a short train that um, to, to this day, I don't understand why the MTA still hasn't made it a full um, eight cars as opposed to the six that it currently exist. Um, in all these cases, um, unreliable with time, the cleanliness is an issue, uh, and uh, this is something I want to take very serious, an alternative to transportation in an area that I think um, has a, a, a lot of people that are going to continue to move in with a limited amount, uh, limited amounts of transportation options. But in taking it serious, I want to make sure that I ask you the right questions, which come down to cost and alternatives. So, oh, there you go. That's my time. Good use of time, sir. Um, I, I couldn't agree with your assessment more, and I think that speaks to uh, exactly what we're here to talk about. Uh, you know, looking at the level of growth, and it may be you know, acutely felt in places like Williamsburg where there's both a lot of growth and it's happening quickly, and you know, I don't want to get into the definition exactly of a well-served or poorly served neighborhood, but broadly speaking, you know, you list the, the number of transit uh, uh, options that you have today between the L, the G, the ferry, and there, that's many other neighborhoods would be happy to, or happier to have even some of those. But to, exactly to your point, sir, um, you look at, at the diversity of options that you have, and there still is more need, more need for more choices and options that better reflect exactly how people make their way to their destination, be it the job or off to you know go to a recreational uh, area. So um, I think I think it's, it's it's well said and it's a good point, and we're always trying to both work on more options and better connections to the existing ones. Um, for cost, uh, our cost estimate ended up at a $2.7 billion estimate. Um, and, and that was on the, the final or the, 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 the current proposed alignment that we're going to go into our environmental impact statement with, which is the 11-mile route running from Red Hook up to Astoria. Um, we, we, arrange, we, we, we arrived at that number based on a series of assumptions about you know, how much track we'd have to build, where we'd have a, a train yard, how many vehicles we'd need to uh, purchase to operate the fleet, um, the amount of utilities we'd have to relocate, and, and who, would, who would pay for those. And some of the major distinctions between um, previous estimates, which were around $2.5 billion, but for a, a larger 16-mile route with, a, you know, with the removal of, of Sunset Park from the initial proposal, um, was really due to being more conservative around carrying escalation numbers, accounting for a, a 2024 construction start with a completion in 2029. So we, we moved up the numbers to uh, allow for the, a longer construction period and happening later. We uh, factored in higher contingency rates to reflect the amount that we know or more accurately don't know around uh, conditions that we're likely to come into, and factored in more specifics around um, some of the bridge costs, some of the, um, the potential to acquire private property, um, and uh, the, the deal with the unknowns that we may encounter, like remediation or hazardous materials under the earth. Um, in terms of paying for it, that's where um, we, again, were very conservative in coming up with a value, value capture analysis. We, we projected that the, um, the BQX, the addition of more transit options in, in the streetcar mode, would, uh, would create a, a, um, a 1.3 to $1.4 billion um, additional revenues that the city would collect over 40 years. That's about 1.8% increase over um, residential values and 2% on commercial over 40 years. 
And while initially there was um, hope or even expectation that the value capture could pay for the entire project itself, I think we were extremely conservative in the way we looked at the, the value analysis. We were consistent in not having any other associated land use actions um, with the BQX, so there are no additional rezonings or uh, city actions that would, that would cause more or additional growth or value to, to be caused. Um, and th that, you know, that leaves us with a gap between what we think the value capture model earns us and uh, what we think it would cost for the project to be delivered. And for that, we need to um, seek additional funds to, to address that. And our, our, we are talking with the federal government around uh, funds. We're, we're, that's going to be one of the important steps in pursuing the EIS. That's a prerequisite, um, as well as advancing our design to make our case uh, around the transit benefits to the, the federal government for the remainder of the funds. Um, for alternatives to your third question, um, our EIS does plan to look at a, uh, a BRT, or bus rapid transit, as a, as a real alternative to the streetcar. And um, I'd ask uh, Chris or Rebecca to talk a little bit about how BRT or SBS may fit in as an alternative and perhaps a little bit about the differences of, between those two. Uh, sure. Um, I guess what I'll say is that as part of the technical analysis that was done for this study, um, there was sort of a screening of all potential modes. It's kind of standard practice when you look at a corridor to look at all potential modes, um, not just BRT and um, and streetcar, but things like subway and aerial tram, and you know some of those were screened out pretty quickly, just due to costs and impacts. I, I hope helicopters and part of that. I'd have to look, but you, you're probably yeah. right. I don't think we went that. They went that far. Um, they the. Uh, at the end of the day, or not the end of the day, but as a result of that initial assessment, um, it was found that streetcar was the preferred option. However, a bus rapid transit uh, option was identified as kind of the second ranking one and one that was worthy of further exploration. Um, so as part of, as Seth mentioned, as part of the EIS, um, we look forward to and we're required to study alternatives to what our preferred concept is right now. Uh, and we look forward to digging deeper into the pot a potential bus option. Chris, can you tell us, a little, wh wh you, you said you pulled from, from what? You pulled that something was ranked, the BQX was ranked first, the street li light rail was ranked first, and then BRT ranked second. Is that a DOT study that you're, you're pulling it from? Uh, no, that was part of the, the EDC contracted work. That was and that's already happened? Correct. And when did that, that happen? Initial study. Um, it would probably have been somewhere around 2017, somewhere in 2017, 2017. 2016 or 2017. Is that a report that we can get, that, um, we, that the committee can get? I would have to defer to EDC on. Yeah, so absolutely, council member, we can share the, uh, we, can, we can try to see what um, other information we have to, to be able to share with you all on specific mode comparison. The, the report that we released in August does um, have, a, um, have a high level comparison of modes, everything from, um, from the streetcar to bus rapid transit to other sorts of services, but we can see what other information that's more in depth beyond the report that we can share with you. Okay, that'd be great. I'm gonna hand this over to Councilmember Van Bramer from Queens, uh, and we have been joined by Councilmember Costa Constantinides. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I wanna first start off by welcoming uh, a lot of friendly faces that I see are in the audience from Queensbridge, Ravenswood, uh, and Astoria houses in particular in Queens. Uh, um, great to see so many great New Yorkers in uh, the People's House. Um, and it is my honor and privilege to represent so many of you in the council. I just wanna say at the outset, I believe clearly there's a need for more and better uh, transportation options. I think all of us can agree on that. We want better uh, mass transit options, particularly for uh, residents in public housing. Uh, and, and that's important to me. I think that's important to everyone in this room. I have some questions just about um, the administration's commitment to this, because as the chair alluded to, we've been talking about it for a few years. Um, there have been some changes along the way, and um, 
then I just want to know if we're going to keep talking about it or if something's going to happen, because um, I don't want anyone to have any false expectations. So I have a few questions. I'll ask them in sort of rapid fire succession as well so I can meet my timeline, and then maybe you can share some of, of the answers. Um, one is the federal uh, contribution here that we think is necessary. And that's a change from the beginning, and I understand that plans change all the time. But while we, uh, I will speak for myself, while I will hope and pray and work to make sure that there's a different occupant of the White House in two years, uh, the current occupant is not necessarily the most friendly to uh, New York City, ironically enough. Um, how do you anticipate overcoming that, that barrier if, in fact, we continue to have a hostile occupant of the White House, and yet we require federal funding to actually make this a reality. Um, the second, and I was interested in what you just said about the uh, EIS, and, and uh, I think DOT said that BRT is, is an alternative, uh, your second uh, choice, but is an alternative. Is it possible that after the EIS, is completed, you'll come back and say, well, you know, I actually took a look at this whole thing, weighing the first option, which is the BQX, and then that second preferred option, which was BRT. Is it possible that you're gonna come back at that point and say, after looking at all of this and doing the IES, uh, the BRT uh, is actually the more doable option? Um, and uh, that gets to my sort of commitment. Um, is the administration fully committed to this um, and implementing it? And those are two things that, that I think speak to both its, its realization, uh, but then also uh, the potential for it to either uh, slow down, peter out, uh, to use some uh, puns in the transportation world. And, um, and so that's what I'm trying to figure out here. We're not faced with a a decision yet because we sort of don't know exactly what we're looking at, right? We were sort of, it's sort of still being decided. There are still changes being made. We know we need better uh, and more uh, transportation options, but I'm trying to assess just from my early look at this, uh, how committed and how realistic is this? Yeah. Thank you, Council Member. Um, we, are, um, we are planning to continue uh, our dialogue with the community, and I hear you loud and clear about talking, um, and uh, it's an important part of the process, obviously, um, towards this, uh, throughout the summer. And uh, in the fall, we will actually be beginning the formal process of uh, EIS, uh, EIS work, uh, and that will be um, followed by our, our uh, scoping process, which is where we will present what we think the, the range of the project would be and let people respond to it to make sure we are studying the right components of it. So I think that will be real material process, real material progress, and um, further explain exactly where we are and uh, how we can seek the community's inputs on what exactly the project is, as well as alternatives to it. Um, if I could answer that third question second, um, you know, putting in the BRT analysis is, it is not atypical in the slightest to put in a real alternative inside of an EIS. This is a uh, extremely complicated project. It's uh, with uh, very different types of funding sources and governance models potentially and operations models and a very complicated uh, set of uh, construction steps and sequencing steps. There's a lot to look at and consider. And when we benchmarked our progress against other streetcar projects around, around the United States, we found that we're moving at a fairly similar time frame that they are. Um, so what I think you'll see as we get the EIS up and running is a further development of what the BRT option is, um, what it can do very well, what it may not meet in terms of expectations, or like around cost savings or what the trade-offs are for um, by reducing the capital cost via a BRT versus a streetcar, what you may lose in terms of ridership or time savings for people using it. Um, so I think that's a, a, a great um, format and process to have those conversations around the trade-offs and the choices and how much benefit or savings we actually get out of the different alternatives. Just to follow up real quick, uh, Chair, so then, so that's sort of my, my, my point is uh, you're doing an EIS on this proposed BQX, uh, but it sounds like you're sort of simultaneously doing an EIS on the BRT option as well. And, uh, 
if not specifically, but, but because you're, you're entertaining that option and looking at all of the cost and benefit analysis, as you should in any kind of major planning effort, is it possible then that you come back after completing the EIS and say, you know what, we've looked at all of this, both options, completely top to bottom, talk to everyone, weighed out all the cost, benefits, and, and come back with the BRT being the preferred option? Yeah, I, I want to be very clear and echo what my colleague Chris said um, about this. We, we looked at the, the different modes, the uh, streetcar versus a BRT, and we felt strongly that from a ridership, from a time savings, from a uh, ability to generate value that would help offset the capital cost, that the, the streetcar was a better option that met more of our goals. Um, that said, we are going to do a full analysis of a BRT as an alternative and have the conversation around those pros and cons, and we'll see where, where, where we come out of it with. It's, it's a real alternative, and it's something we're gonna look at seriously. Um, so I think that's an answer to your question. Um, la lastly, on the federal funds, I don't pretend to be an expert on either the Trump administration or Washington, D.C. Um, obviously, there are challenges there. Uh, we think we have a lot of merits for um, the project, and we'll be uh, continuing our conversations with them, and, and one of our prerequisites is completing a a federally compliant EIS, which we'll be doing and advancing some of the, the design which will be happening as part of this EIS and, um, and continuing the conversations there around uh, sources of additional funds. No one fully understands the Trump administration, even the people in the Trump administration. Good. Yeah, probably correct. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Costa Constantinides. Thank you, Chairman Chaka. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, good morning, still, I guess. Uh, it's good to see uh, Ms. Claudia Coger and, and Bishop Mitchell Taylor here as well. It's always good to have friends from Astoria here in, in City Hall. Uh, you know, I, I, so I'll, I'll echo in my beginning uh, what Councilman Van Bramer said is that we recognize the need for different transit options. Uh, the end of the Hallett's Cove Peninsula is 1,515 feet. Not that I've gone on Google Maps and gained that ad at all from Manhattan, uh, and yet it's one of the longest commutes in the city. And in our district, but in my district, and you know the ferry has been a huge win for the residents on the Howes Cove Peninsula. Um, now looking at this streetcar, I am intrigued, but I have some real concerns. Uh, the concerns that I have are around the value capture. Um, this corridor uh, is one of the most gentrified parts of my district. That things are, homes are being torn down. There is a real affordability crisis. Uh, in this part of our community, and I see that the value capture is going to go all the way to the train line on 31st Street, which is only going to make the uh, challenges in Astoria even greater. What are we doing to safeguard affordability and make sure that our neighborhoods aren't just, you know, we're knocking down buildings continuously to build new buildings, and, and what are we doing to protect those residents? Um, we talk about traffic. Uh, I know DOT, we've gamed out over 2,000 cars an hour on uh, you know, 21st Street, where the streetcar is scheduled to go. How, and it's also a truck route. And it's, this street functions more like a highway than a street. What are we going to do on 21st Street um, to you know, make sure that pedestrians are kept safe, that bicyclists are kept safe, that this is actually you know, we'll, continue, we'll start functioning more like a street. We've made some improvements. We're in need of more improvements there. What are we going to do with the streetcar coming in to really make sure that people get the message that this is a neighborhood here? We have senior centers. We have schools. We have the Variety Boys and Girls Club. I mean, this is a real community. How are we going to safeguard that with putting, with shrinking lanes and making things even more crowded? Um, you know, those are some of my questions, because we have trucks that are there and they don't treat our community like we're a neighborhood. They're a pass-through to get to Manhattan. Um, that's always been one of my you know, big concerns. And then looking at you know, how many cars do we expect to get off the road by doing this, right? Like what, is, what, are our, what are the environmental benefits? Have we thought about that? I know we're about to do an EIS, but you know, what are we gaming out here? for environmental benefits, because this part of the community has higher than the borough average asthma rates, ER admissions, hospitalizations. You know, they're already overwhelmed when it comes to emissions. What are we gonna do to improve air quality there, and is, is this gonna be part of our analysis? 
Uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, a great set of, of important questions. And if I could start with the, the gentrification or affordability concerns, that's one that we are very aware of and take incredibly seriously. Uh, I think the, the answer is, is a multi-part one. Um, and, and, and essentially, we, we look at a corridor that is, uh, across the entire corridor, 25% um, uh, of residences are in um, owner-occupied houses, and another 56% are in some form of rent-controlled uh, residence where they have some protections against affordability rising. Um, it, it left without the BQX and kind of a no-build scenario, if you will, you're already seeing a lot of the concerns that you have with growth happening. What we think is that by putting in the BQX, we're giving more options for the people who do live and will continue to live uh, in the area for them to have transportation options. Mr. Chair, can I just throw in something really quick? Um, for the for the owner occupied buildings, um, you know, they may be, you know, they're they're property rich and cash poor, right? It might be seniors, it might be you know in, individuals who have the, you know this is the American dream to buy their home, and now that property is going to increase. I want to sort of I hope that's being factored into your calculus as well. Yeah, and and we will have a a robust uh, analysis around some of the socioeconomic impacts in, in, as part of our EIS, and that's a dialogue that we're we're continuing to have. I also really take pride in this administration's efforts for things like tenant protections, uh, increasing the amount of affordability of, of, of housing, and being very um, unapologetic in, in, in allowing uh, and fighting for people to stay in their neighborhoods and stay in their homes, and um, not apologizing for trying to improve uh, transit connections to areas in, in a way that um, you know requires us to strike that balance of how do we improve something that we know is going to make a neighborhood more accessible, but yet allow people to stay there and not have to make a choice about having good, good transit or a neighborhood that they can afford to stay in. Uh, so it's, it, it is a balance. It is one we take incredibly seriously and are going to be continuing to address and, ta and talk about more and, and, and analyze more. Um, Chris, did you want to talk a little bit about the transit impacts? Sure. I think you had two questions. One was about um, congestion more generally and 21st more specifically, and then it was about sort of the air quality implications. Um, in terms of talking about 21st Street, we, we fully recognize at DOT that that's a challenging street that has heavy traffic volumes, exactly as you say. Um, we've tried to work to put in um, safety measures, some pedestrian safety measures. Uh, we want to do more. In terms of the BQX, um, one thing that would benefit, right now the alignment would be a center running alignment, which would mean that the stations would be in the middle of the road. Um, what that also means is that at station locations, there would be, in effect, a pedestrian refuge so that uh, people crossing at those locations wouldn't have to cross all six lanes at one time. They'd have a place um, uh, to stop if they needed to. And we found that in terms of pedestrian safety countermeasures, placing pedestrian refuges is one of the, the biggest things you can do. Um, in terms of air quality, um, impacts, this is a fully electric vehicle. Um, it wouldn't have any local pollution at all. Um, obviously, we try to source the electricity so that it would be as close to zero emissions as possible overall. So in terms of contributing to air quality and um, uh, greenhouse gassing emission global warming goals, um, it's something that would do so. Um, in terms of actually quantifying that, I mean, we'll do that, as you say, in the EIS. It's a matter of quantifying how many people are changing from more polluting um, modes, like vehicles, to, uh, to this mode where you don't have any pollution at all. And that's not 100% of the new riders, but that's a percentage of the new riders we do anticipate will be getting out of cars and into the streetcar. I guess before I, I, um, I go, the chair has granted me one last question, um, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, around freight delivery, um, you know, this, this corridor is also um, you know, a business corridor, and we see challenges now on 21st Street around the issues of, you know, when a delivery happens, we have double parked cars. With a, a shrunk streetscape, what is our thought process around freight delivery times and hours, and how are we going to keep things moving? Right, we're going to have we have an electric streetcar down the middle of the of the street, but if we aren't 
you know, planning out what we're going to see on the street itself, we're going to have congestion backed up on 21st Street much more, contributing to emissions in our communities. So what's our thought process there on, on freight delivery in the long term? Sure, I can take that. Yeah, I think freight delivery is a, first of all, ensuring that in these commercial corridors there can be both passenger loading, but more importantly, goods loading and unloading is an important part of DOT and what we do. We have a whole group that focuses on that. Um, and some of our late, some of our most recent focuses, focus has been looking at innovative ways to make that happen, whether that's overnight deliveries. We have a pilot program on that. Um, we have, uh, often now we look at, you know, does, it, does the delivery have to be right on the main street or could it be right around the corner on one of the spur roads? Some, in some cases that works. Um, we're even looking at delivery by bicycle. Will it work everywhere? Maybe not, but this is something we're piloting. Um, and it's not just 21st Street, it's other commercial corridors along, or I should say other commercial corridors along the alignment um, that we will need to work very closely, the city will need to work very closely on making sure that this works for businesses. Um, I would point out that um, in addition to, you know, needing these challenges and needing to work them out, um, you know, this will also be a, this will also have positive impacts for business with, with um, you know, 50,000 people a, or 50,000 rides a day provided on this service. Some of those rides are going to get off and shop at the businesses and certainly in an environment. In environments like Kansas City, which are very car dominated, they've seen um, growth in their sales receipts based on um, the streetcar. So in an area like New York City, where it's not as car dominated, I would expect that this would have a positive contribution um, to, uh, to the commercial community. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Constantinides. I, I have to say one thing really quick before I go um, into next questions, next round of questions. So we, we have a budget negotiating team meeting right now, and so this is why you're seeing members come and go. Uh, but I will, I will keep with the questions. Uh, they care about this project and they're texting me ideas and questions as well. So I just want you to know that the members that were here today are at a budget negotiating team. We're in budget season. So let's go right up. We're gonna put up a slide that talks a little bit about the costs. Many of the questions that members have are about costs and I want us to kind of walk through this. Um, the first uh, slide that we wanted to put up was the comparison between 2016 and 2018 for the BQX fiscal analysis here. And in 2016, we had a 16 mile route and we had a cost per mile. That cost went up in 2018 at a shorter route. And this is one of those big moments. I think the press really caught on to this. What happened here? Walk us through, what, how, how did this happen? And now we have Sunset Park as, 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 as a question here, not because we want the BQX in Sunset Park, I think that's been very clear, um, but because now we're not focused anymore on this corridor that really excited a lot of people because of the jobs. I think there's a lot of values that we're, we're all pointing to, like jobs and, and, and economic opportunities. But let's just answer the question about the cost. How did this happen? Thank you. It's an important question, um, and it's one that, you know, we, we took a look at at the both the amount of information that we had and the way that we structured our uh, our estimate and and the way we made certain assumptions around it, and um, both with a best practices of making sure that we were identifying the right need and the um, the full need, so we would not be in the place of of having a lower estimate than we we assumed, and. Um, and also following some federal guidelines about the right way to price, um, uh, which was important that we, again, be in compliance with, with federal best practices there. Um, what Wait, can I pause you there, Seth? So let's just, let's just take that, that one statement. I wanna break it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you had information. I think Chris was talking about a 2017 data sheet that gave you sense of information. Are you saying that 2016, where did you get the numbers for 2016 to get you to cost per mile for the BQX? What did you use for that? 
Sure, this was um, the 2016 report there, uh, and you see from the footnote, that was what we were uh, referring to as our rapid assessment. That was uh, taking the proposal that we received initially um, and doing- And that proposal came from where? That was from that group of public stakeholders and the, the re residents along- And that's the what we're, call, we're calling the Friends of the Friends BQX. Of the BQX. That's okay. correct. That's the proposal you got. Yep, that's right. Okay. And, and that, please. Uh, but, but to be clear there, that was, um, that was the, the city's independent analysis of, of that idea of that project that was proposed. So um, they had uh, their own independent report, which uh, the city took, rethunk, uh, re rethought the assumptions that were baked therein, uh, did our own value capture analysis, et cetera. So I would, just, I would just draw that distinction, council yeah. member, and it's a, it's a good question, uh, between the uh, initial report that was done by the, by the private party and then the city adopting uh, taking a look at that idea and producing the numbers you see here. That's right. Thank you, Will. Um, so this was our initial and uh, first takeoff, our number based on their proposal, as Will correctly clarified. Um, and I think that was with, you know, a, a few months' worth of feasibility and review to come up with that. In the intervening period with a much larger, um, more dedicated team to it and a lot more time and resources to it, we revised and revised again our number, looking at different assumptions around both the route, the alignment, uh, and assumptions about uh, the condition of utilities and soil quality that we would find. We did a series of test pits and actually investigated what was physically in the street to help inform that cost estimate and got, frankly, a lot smarter about what a streetcar network would look like in terms of how many vehicles we'd need to, um, need to have running and available for it, the power supply, the amount of power substations we need to site along the route, and, um, and then adding in what we think is appropriate but conservative um, sets of uh, contingencies and allowances on top of that to come up with the, the final number that we did. Thank you. And the friends of the BQX are going to be testifying later, and we'll ask them how they got it. That way we can kind of piece all this together. Um, but just to recap, the 2016 was a rapid review from private part, the par private partners that, that you received the initial proposal from, and then you did the work, and two years later came up with a different number, a shorter route, removing Sunset Park from this. And the one question I have on Sunset Park, just so we can get it out, is, is the EIS also including Sunset Park as part of the corridor for discussion? So let, let me just clarify for the avoidance of doubt, and hopefully it's not repetitive. We received the proposal. That proposal had its own set of assumptions or uh, uh, details around what they thought the alignment would be, what they thought the cost of it would be. We performed a, a rapid assessment, looking at that proposal, evaluating what worked, what didn't, and coming up with numbers that we thought a proposal could be. So we were already deviating from what they proposed. In, in large part, it was following a similar concept. It's a streetcar along the Brooklyn Queens waterfront. But we, we made several changes to it, and that was the in initial number, as a, the outcome of our rapid assessment, that we thought it would cost. So uh, I'm sorry if that's repetitive. I just wanted to be absolutely No, it's, it's really important to get, to get clear. Yep. Uh, it's going to help us understand the full, under give us a full understanding. And then you did it again for 2018. That's correct. And that's the August report with, that with, came out. With the, with the benefit of uh, the of design the that we team, performed, the and, larger team, okay. the analysis that I mentioned previously. That's right. Great. Um, and then you, to your question about Sunset Park in the EIS, it is, it is not going to be in the EIS. That's correct. Sunset Park is not going to be in the EIS, even if you're thinking about BRT and other alternatives? C correct. Okay. And so tell us, tell us a little bit about how, how that decision is made. Uh, I'm assuming that Sunset Park for EDC is an important portfolio for economic development. And so tell us a little bit about how that Correct. So how that got decided and can that change? As you well know, Sunset Park is incredibly important to ADC and one we take a lot of pride in. Oh, oh, oh I know. A lot of <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, the rationale that we, we removed it from, from our, our BQX study was that it was, uh, it was very expensive. It required a, a crossing of the Gowanus um, and the bridge of, of several hundred million dollars to get, to get the, uh, the train there. And then it was a several mile run that really didn't attract the level of ridership that seemed to justify that, uh, that cost and that potential disrupt disruption to a lot of the local businesses. There are, as you know, an extensive amount of curb cuts and businesses that are really dependent on heavy truck deliveries as you have a very active industrial area. Um, we did not want to disrupt that. And with the limited benefits of, of riderships for residents of the area, 
we, we just determined that that was not going to be the right fit for, for the project. So we, we removed it from the BQX proposal, uh, which is by no means to say that that is the end of conversation on how to improve transit access or transportation access to Sunset Park. It's just going to be a different, a different uh, vehicle, if you will, to deliver that. Couldn't we benefit from a conversation that includes Sunset Park as part of a conversation in general about transportation and connecting job centers to people along the corridor? I'm thinking about Red Hook getting to Sunset Park and that being something very important for residents. And so that, is, that an, is that an opportunity to open that up and allow for the corridor to remain as you look at alternatives like bus? Uh, I, I think, I think the, the answer to that is we are always delighted, as are our colleagues at DOT, to talk about different ways we can solve transportation gaps or problems. I think using the EIS process for BQX, BQX may not be the right forum to have that conversation, um, and perhaps it's, it's another uh, either DOT process around SBS or other street improvements or something around uh, with EDC and in, in the NYC ferry that we might be able to talk about different alternatives or just coordinating with both of us, which can happen sometimes um, when things are working well, uh, around city bike or other, you know, uh, other options we have to improve access. We'd be happy to have that conversation. Okay. Well, we'll just move on. Made the point. We're going to move on. Okay, let's talk about the next slide. Let's, to, let's show the, the uh, bus rapid transit project slide here. Uh, I don't know if you can see that from where you're at right now. But essentially, you have the kind of comparisons for the select bus ridership and the numbers compared to other light rail lines and, or uh, I should say, other cities. BRT numbers, and so the numbers are pretty high here. And I, I kind of want to get a sense about, you said something earlier that the BQX would have, have more ridership than BRT at, and certain numbers, and so I want to get a sense about how you can compare those, and then also look at the cost as well. And, and so how, how, how does the BQX become number one on your analysis sheets when we're seeing kind of cost per mile here and ridership at a different rate? It, it's, it's hard for, to, for us to reconcile. Uh, sure, I can take it. Um, maybe just as a way of sort of clarifying, because I think there are these terms, SBS, BRT, that maybe not everyone in the Please. room may be familiar with. Walk us through 101. Sure. We're here, so we're here to learn. Sure, I, I think sure. Everyone here is um, ready to learn. So uh, SBS stands for Select Bus Service, and it's essentially a brand. It's New York City's brand of something called Bus Rapid Transit, or BRT. So what is Bus Rapid Transit, which is the more generic term? Bus Rapid Transit, or BRT, is basically the application of a number of tools, um, including things like bus priority lanes, um, signal priority to make buses go faster, um, looking at the service, having s stops that are, uh, that are further apart, um, providing vehicles that, that are more appealing, um, having off-board fare collection. So it's a package of, um, of these improvements that you apply to a specific bus service in order to make it faster, more reliable, um, and more attractive. Um, now, there's a whole range of what bus rapid transit, or for that matter, select bus service can consist of. You could do a light touch, maybe put in bus lanes where it's kind of easy to do. In other places, maybe you don't put in bus lanes, but you still have off-board fare collection. Maybe in a few areas, you, you have some signal um, priority. Um, so that's a light touch. There are probably some of our SBS routes that are close to that and others that are, are more robust. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is um, sort of the, the most robust SBS service that you could imagine, right? And, and, and that would mean as close as possible replicating, not replicating, but trying to get as close as possible to something like a rail or traditionally what rail has had. So that means, you know, physically separated bus lanes for most or all of the way. It means um, full raised stations. It might even mean, um, you know, having doors on both sides of the bus so you can, you can board from the center. Um, there are very few examples in the U.S. Um, 
where all of those things are, are manifest in their most robust way. So when you talk about sort of comparing SPS to, uh, to rail, streetcar, or light rail transit, it's important to distinguish sort of or recognize that you could be talking about a number of different things. And you know the examples you give here represent a range of different applications um, of uh, both SBS, or, or in this case, they're all SBS. So uh, I just wanted to put that out to begin with. Um, but in terms I think of our, your our question, but, our but, question is: yeah. Is yeah. are buses faster than the light rail that is being proposed? I think that's that's the question. And and what we're hearing from you is that actually the, the light rail is going to be faster than the bus. And I kind of want to get a sense about about how you're coming to that conclusion, while we're we're kind of already seeing some data showing mm -hmm. that SBS works and mm -hmm. you like it. You're trying to push it out. We're trying to. We're, we're advocating for that as well. I think that's the. If, the, if I, that's if the I core can, perhaps there's question. a. Our, our logic to this was, um, we see many benefits of a streetcar. Um, it, it increases the the value, thus helping with the value capture and offsetting its capital cost. Um, if then we're, one were to say, how do I get the same transportation? So that was a really important thing you just said there. Yep. I just want to unpack that a little sure. bit more. That, that we're going to increase the value of. Of what? The, the value of the streetcar uh, generates uh, an additional um, increase in, in the property values, thus the revenue that we collect versus a BRT, which would, st you know, studies have shown that it generates a, a, a smaller increase as a, like, a, a transit premium. Okay. Sorry. I just wanted to. Yep. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the question would then go, how do I get the same transportation benefit um, and, and how much value do I lose uh, and get some savings back from a BRT as an alternative. And what we found is, to Chris's point, there's a range of different BRT or SBS options you have. And to get the, a commensurate amount of transportation benefit, you end up incurring many of the same capital costs. We found um, in a kind of apples to apples comparison that you're only seeing a, a capital cost savings as, as much as 30%. Um, by doing BRT versus street, uh, you know, a light rail or a streetcar, and, and and that's important too. Let's yep. just unpack that. So you you save more by going to the light rail because it generates more value in property. And I have a few questions about value capture to understand exactly what that means. But you're saying because the because light rail increases property values, and then you can capture that to pay for it, mm -hmm. compared to a bus that doesn't increase property values as, as much. much right and, and I would say I would just add and that the, the, the council member respectfully that the 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 value increase that Seth is citing is is accompanied by a ridership increase that the, the streetcar is seen as a more uh, permanent investment that drives higher ridership numbers as well as the the associated uh, value capture so so we we see that because of um, we see that when folks see a construct a capital construction project taking place with a dedicated right of way with utilities moved out of the right of way so you don't have service interruptions that sort of thing that is seen as a uh, more permanent investment being made by 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 an entity so uh, the ridership generated there is also higher in addition to the to the value capture piece okay let's let's get into the value capture so um, actually yeah let, I'm gonna skip over to the value capture right now and the, so there are many kinds of value captures, right? So let's just get an understanding of that. Can you please explain what that exactly means in terms of the specific value mechanisms that EDC intends to use for the BQX? Will the city need to pay the interest on any debt on a potential bond floated by a new LDC, for example? Uh, or And is NYCHA going to be pay paying into the value capture model? There's a lot of NYCHA along the route. Are they paying in as well? And is that part of the scheme for the mayor's plan for, for paying into this, into this value capture? The, um, the value capture, generally speaking, the idea is that we are, we are causing an improvement that has a benefit uh, to people, which is the ridership and the time savings and how they, they, they use the transit system uh, versus what their alternatives could be. Um, that has, what, what our calculation showed is a, in a half mile radius adjacent to the, the alignment of the streetcar, um, a approximately 1.8 increase in 
revenue collection from residential properties and 2% from commercial values. And that adds up to um, the, the 1.7 billion um, that we would collect over the course of 40 years that would, that would offset that. So the, the concept generally is we would then find a way to capture that value over time by issuing bonds against it. Um, to the specifics, I don't think we are there yet. Um, that's the questions around de determining uh, future governance or, or the op operating model of what, we are, what we're planning to implement. Um, but you know, there are a couple of different ways to do it and uh, a couple of different ways to, to set up the financial structure and uh, how the value is backstopped um, against the, the future revenues. And council member, I would add that in regard to your question specifically about NYCHA properties, um, the, the value capture study that we performed ex specifically excludes tax exempt properties. So um, for properties where there is property tax already being collected, um, they, would be, uh, they would be involved, but for properties that do not pay property tax, they would not. Got it, so Navy Yard, NYCHA, which is a lot of the corridor. Religious institutions, for example. So you're putting the pressure on the private owned spaces. We are. We, I, I just, it's wordsmithing perhaps, but we're not putting the pressure on so much as that's what's generating it. I mean, it, right. that, that, that is, th those are the people that are paying taxes today in a way that right. um, we're not going to be adding taxes to anyone additional or putting pressure on. It's just they are going to be benefiting in large degree from the improvement and would be paying that, that increase over time that I talked about. Great. So uh, again, I want to try to see if I can simplify this for folks that are listening or here today about how this works. So essentially, you have property, said property mile in the corridor. And if you did know BQX, the property would still keep going up, because that's what happens in New York City. Property value goes up. It's a great investment. People come from all over the world, to, uh, which is causing problems. Well, that's another hearing. OK. So BQX comes in, and now the property at x percent goes up. Are you only capturing the value of the increase by measuring, say, an average in, an, uh, in the neighborhood that is not impacted by this investment, and then pulling that those dollars out? That's correct. It, okay. the, the idea is to is to measure and attribute a certain value that was caused by the BQX, and then earmark or set aside that increase to then be reinvested to pay for the, the, uh, the capital it. costs. And so essentially those dollars are not gonna go back into the general revenue to support other things like schools, other things like uh, parks, and other things that the community might need. It'll just go back to pay over time the infrastructure for the BQX. Um, generally speaking, that's right. Um, there is a uh, you know, the, the BQX would be taking the amount of value that it created and using it to offset its cost. Um, I think in the larger picture, there's an enormous benefit of what the BQX can offer. Uh, we, we calculated a $30 billion overall impact, you know, several thousand, 16,000 construction jobs, um, several hundred permanent jobs, uh, 4,000 indirect jobs just as a result of the, as the, of the streetcar going into place. So we think that there are many larger both benefits and uh, financial benefits that would come from it. And again, just so I can understand and unpack it a little bit more, the value capture increases the property value for a property. You're going to take that measured increase of the property value and put it into the BQX which means that the property will have to be paying more in taxes that you're taking to put into the BQX. So you're, we're also going to see an increase in taxes along the corridor. Uh, as, long as, as long as the value uh, continues to increase, that's correct. And what we need to do is attribute the value that is caused by the BQX versus the, the amount of increase that we're seeing, just as to your point, the, you know, uh, the, the value of property in the city is increasing uh, on its own without the BQX happening. Okay, and on the other side of that coin, essentially, so if value doesn't go up and there is no value to capture, then what do we do? That's, that's what the governance model will have to do as it identifies the risks of what happens if there are um, you know, prolonged economic uh, uh, you know, downturns or the, the revenue doesn't materialize the way that we want it to. You, you try to structure these, uh, these arrangements in a way that, that gives some certainty to the people who are going to be buying the bonds, the person issuing the bonds, and um, you know you can set up tranches of, of risk taking that people will buy into or pay for. Um, but are these EDC bonds or are these city bonds? I don't think we're there yet. 
I mean, I think. Okay, I think so that's still that's a big question then. Yep, I, I think there's there's a there's and, a big and tell us both because those are the only options, right? City would do the bond, or the EDC would do the bond, w or if we work to create some an LDC, other a local development corporation, another governance body that would take that on, something like that. Okay, and then the scenarios change from one to the other. So if EDC is kind of held holding holding the bond without being able to pay for it through the capture, then EDC would then have to pay for that because that's your responsibility from EDC, which you'd be taking from your general. So I kind of want to, I want you to play out those scenarios. This is, this is very important for the committee as we think about uh, this project and for the community as well. I mean, these are essentially public funds. Even though EDC has its own pot, it's, these are still public funds that are coming from portfolio, portfolios of property owned by the public. So this is this is important. So EDC, go through the scenarios. Yeah, I don't, EDC. I don't, I, 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 the, the different scenarios that we've looked at would be um, some entity uh, issues bonds that uh, that are backed by the, the increased revenue that would then pay for the capital cost and or the city issues bonds specifically for it um, against that value again. Um, there are a couple of different iterations within that um, but we're simply not there yet. That's something we're gonna have to continue to look at exactly the mechanism of that financial arrangement. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. We're gonna look at that too, clearly, on our side as well. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Cumbo, who's along the corridor as well, and, uh, or the newly proposed corridor anyway, because the corridor did change with some questions. Thank you, Chairman Chaka. Had a few brief questions um, about the process. So. With this particular uh, design, have you looked at other urban cities who have done a similar light rail to this one in urban cities, and more specifically, urban cities that didn't have some sort of trolley system in place that then got upgraded, but where you're laying down brand new, never seen before, light rail in an urban city? Are there, are there cities that you've looked at or documented or understand the outcomes uh, from that experience? Uh, I can take that majority leader combo. Chris Rones of Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. um, the project looked at all sorts of precedents, both in North America and abroad. Um, there, are all, there are a number of different types of models. Um, there are certainly um, when people think of streetcar, sometimes I think, or modern streetcar, a lot of times they'll think of, you know, sort of a downtown circulator that, um, that is more focused on economic revitalization, um, maybe in a Midwestern or Western city. That's sort of very different from what we're talking about here. Um, we're talking about actually, although we're calling it a streetcar, it's not that sort of streetcar at all. It's, it's No, I it's, understand exactly. Yeah. But, I, but I'm, there are some that might have had a streetcar model that might have gotten upgraded to what we're talking about with efficiency, uh, state of the art, brand new, uh, energy efficient, all of these different sorts of things. Is there a city that, an urban city more specifically, that is doing what New York is proposing to do? I think the closest uh, analogy is actually abroad in France. There are multiple French cities um, that actually introduced new streetcars into dense urban environments. Um, and one of the things that's a little bit different about how they approach it there, they call them trams generally, but is they tend to be more focused on higher speed um, st uh, station spacing to really um, to really uh, ensure those higher speeds, um, covering large corridors, large parts of the city. Um, and like I said, you know, there are multiple cities in France that have that characteristic. The other sort of analogy I'll point to right across the river is the Hudson Bergen light rail project. Although that's called a light rail and we're calling ours a streetcar, there are a lot of similarities there in terms of work, you know, Re refitting a streetcar or a, a rail into, um, you know, an old, er, old, older urban environment, and also focusing more on the commuter, on the uh, the, tra the traveler, 
as opposed to thinking of it as purely an economic model, an economic development project, although that was certainly part of that project. There, there was a lot of economic revitalization that accompanied that project. What I would be more specifically interested in and would even think it warrants a hearing specifically on that would be looking at those models, particularly in urban cities, and really unpacking and understanding the impact that it has on those communities. Because while we may talk about urban renewal and economic development, um, those often have uh, casualties that are very real to many residents in those areas. So for example, in my district, I represent five NYCHA developments. Um, three of them would be more in close proximity to where the BQX is being proposed. I would want to understand while the benefits of ease of transportation seem very exciting and we can make all sorts of different arguments about how this will connect people to jobs, employment, move faster, and those sorts of things, but there are also challenges in terms of displacement and understanding how those communities will be impacted by this quote unquote great opportunity that's being proposed for their neighborhoods. So has that type of economic impact study been done to show how displacement arises, how people are removed from their communities, how uh, property values increase because now you're connected to a popular transportation hub. And we know one of the major uh, factors in terms of how communities become more um, affluent or more attractive is all around transportation. So any place where there are multiple train hubs and ease to get to work or ease to get to wherever you're going, that becomes a, a destination for uh, uh, people that want to move into the community and displace others. So have those sorts of impact, uh, economic impact studies been done around this project based off of samples from other cities? Um, so I'm not aware of a specific study that specifically in the type of environment that you're talking about. I know in some of these other types of environments, they have looked at the impacts. Um, I mean, I guess I would say from a gentrification standpoint, which, which is what you're concerned about. Um, I mean, I think- And I'm sure you're concerned about it too. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, just I'll speak from the DOT standpoint. I mean, obviously being part of the administration, we're concerned about equity, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think our role in ensuring that equity continues to, uh, that this continues to be an equitable city is on the transportation side of things, making sure, as you mentioned, that people have those opportunities, that they have um, uh, transportation service in neighborhoods that are challenged that are just as good as they have in Manhattan or other neighborhoods that currently have best, better transportation. Um, so that's kind of our focus when it comes to equity. That being said, we recognize that there are many different components of equity and you know, I think maybe EDC or someone else is better, better positioned to speak about sort of what we're doing as a city to ensure that with these improvements, whether it be transportation or other things, there are strategies in place to make sure people can stay in their neighborhoods. Yeah, council member, I would just, um, I think it's a critical question and I think it's one that we are going to be judged on how successful a project is by how much it has or doesn't have an impact, not only on like transit benefits or ridership benefits or time savings, but what it means to the actual neighborhood and its growth or its retention of character or retention of residents. Um, I think your suggestion around uh, an additional dialogue is a, a great one. It's a, it's a complicated balance that we're trying to, 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 to strike the right note on between offering those opportunities and offering those benefits and also ensuring that we don't displace. Um, you know, there are a, a long list of things that this administration has been pushing hard for, for tenant protections and rent control guidelines, um, and those are an important part of it. It's a obviously multifaceted and complicated set of protections and set of initiatives that are, that, that are underway across the administration far beyond our agencies or, or this group here today or the BQX, but it, it's an important one and one that the, the BQX will be judged by, I, I believe. Um, 
and, and, and to that end, you know, we, we have been very aware of this issue from the outset. It's something we've been looking at as we structure the, the value capture scenario, as we make sure that we are leaving plenty of room in our value capture um, to assume that there are uh, large affordable housing programs that continue or that we're not going to be collecting value from nonprofit or non-taxpaying properties like we mentioned earlier. Um, and, and then there will be continued analysis around socioeconomic impacts uh, as we go through the EIS, which will be yet another uh, forum for that conversation to continue. But in, in any way that we can make sure we are striking th the best balance possible, that is, a, that is a, a, you know, a metric or a goal that we are extremely committed to meeting. I appreciate that. However, I feel that that question should be really what's driving this process. So I don't want it to be after a couple of years of conversations around this, that that is a conversation or that that's not a reality that's driving this particular process. I can, because I can, yep. for elected officials to really understand what we're looking at, we really have to understand that information about how this is specifically going to impact our districts, our community, our people, particularly those that are the most vulnerable economically. Mm -hmm. How is this going to benefit them? How is this going to um, displace them? Because those are real issues, and in order for us to make an educated decision or to have real conversation, we have to know that. Um, I also wanted to, uh, delve into just two more issues and then I turn it back to the chair around hiring. What are your thoughts in terms of the plans that have been put forward in terms of how this is going to benefit? Um, I'll just go specifically to my NYCHA residents. How will they benefit from employment for the building and the creation of a proposed BQX? How will training happen? How will outreach happen? Um, how has this been done before? I really want to understand that. Oh, great questions. Um, I think on your first point about evaluating the local impacts, we're at a stage where I, I certainly don't want to get carts ahead of horses in terms of doing something and then finding out whether it's effective or not or it's, it's striking the right balance or not. And I, I don't think we are in a place where the cart is ahead of the horse here. We've done our initial design. We think it offers a lot of merits and opportunities. We're setting, we're you know embarking on an EIS process, which is exactly I think the right point to have that dialogue, and 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 share our facts, and then decide if we want to continue with it or make modifications to it. And as uh, Councilmember Menchaca knows, you know, I've I've had one of my more impressive uh, changes to an EIS project that I was working on as a response of of, of into working with the council and the community, where we heard it, we checked our set of facts. We changed in response to what the community asked for and, and took a different approach around uh, NYC Ferry. So that's something, uh, you know, we'd commit to having a really uh, candid and open discussion with, with you about, and I think it's the right process. Um, uh, so to that point. On, on, on local hiring, on um, opportunities for NYCHA residents or local residents along the alignment, it's, um, it's specifically, it's a little premature to be answering yet. We still have to look at exactly how we are going to be building operating and maintaining um, the, the system and the structure around it. I think what, what we have found at EDC uh, is that we have very aggressive um, MWBE goals where we are exceeding the 30% goal set by the city uh, ahead of schedule. It's something we take an enormous amount of pride in and are frequently uh, held accountable to internally. Uh, um, we take it very seriously on a company-wide basis. We always look for opportunities to reach out to different um, different sectors that we can pull from, whether it's uh, finding new uh, MWBE firms that aren't, we don't work with now, or just new firms generally, whether it's finding opportunities to hire more from the community, um, or, um, or when we're talking about less about construction jobs and more about long-term jobs working with SBS, the Small Business Services and Workforce One, that was something we saw um, a very large number of uh, candidates come from for NYC Ferry when they when when Hornblower, the operator of that, started hiring people. Um, so we've seen a lot of uh, cross connections where we can partner with uh, local communities, the MWBE construction community, and uh, partner agencies like SBS to find those opportunities and create them. 
And, and council member, I would just add that with the, with the higher NYC program and the, the contract language that EDC uses to, to, to compel the, the private parties with which we work to advertise jobs locally first, you know, I think, um, a, a, as we discussed earlier, I think we um, were estimating more than 10,000 temporary construction jobs uh, for the project, several hundred jobs to, um, several hundred jobs to, uh, on a permanent basis to operate the system. So I think, you know, given the fact that we, um, this is both connecting people to opportunity as a project as a whole, I think the project itself will also create an enormous amount of opportunity for folks up and down the corridor and the, the language um, that EDC has been begun implementing in, in many of its contracts and development agreements um, accommodates for making sure that folks on the ground uh, who live in these communities hear about the jobs first, are, are, um, are shown these jobs first, and, and get hired on these jobs. It would be helpful to, those numbers are helpful in terms of the amount of jobs that are going to be created, but I would like to know more specifically uh, a, a pipeline or a training program and what that's going to look like. Because out of the so many jobs, some will require a level of training, others will not require a level of training. Some are very specific trades that um, are necessary. I want to understand anytime you're doing a project of this scale, everybody wants to know how it's going to benefit them. And so if so much of this development is going to happen in and around and near NYCHA developments, then they have to understand and we have to understand as elected officials, how is it going to benefit them? How is this going to create jobs? How is this going to connect them to jobs? How is this going to affect the future of their NYCHA development? All of these questions have to be answered um, in order to make rational decisions about what's happening next. The, the, the last thing you want to do as an elected is to make a decision on behalf of a community and this uh, be something that potentially could exacerbate gentrification in a highly gentrified community. And my final question is, what level or percentage, and Councilmember Menchaca may have asked this already, what percentage of private investment in order to create the BQX has been estimated? Is it, are you looking at some level of private um, uh, investment, or is this something that you're looking specifically at uh, for governmental support? It is a good question. Um, we, it came up a little bit, but I think we kind of brushed by it. Uh, right now, the the value capture, which is 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 tax revenue that's collected by by the city, um, pays for a little over half of the project. Um, the remaining uh, funding that we need to to do to, to do the full capital cost of it. We're looking into federal funds for that. There are different funding models where you can ask, and this depends on how you are implementing the project and structuring the finances around it, where on large design build or private public private partnerships uh, or P3 arrangements, where you can ask the private parties that are responding to your procurement to build or operate the, the system to come in with their own financing as, as incentive for them to see success or a certain outcome of it. So um, the answer is we don't know yet, but there are scenarios where there could be a variety of different funding options. So another hearing will be in order. We're, we're happy to continue <laughs> the conversation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Majority Leader Cumbo from Brooklyn. And I, I want to I, I wanna ask a question, and I know you're going to go back to B&T, but this is an important moment that she asked about each of the council districts are going to have their own conversations with their communities. And can you walk us through what the ULERT process might look like if we get to a point where the BQX is a, 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 an option that we all want to move forward with and, and engage in a ULERT process? How do you do that with seven po possible more districts? What does that look like? Lay it out. I think it's important for people here to know how, how that works. And this isn't just a money game and a lot of the focus, and I want to thank everyone for staying here because this is, this is the first time we had a conversation like this in open. Like we're learning a lot of information right now, and thank you for your patience to, to really sit through this because this is going to help us all understand what we're going to do at the end of the day because we're going to do this together. Uh, you're not going to be making the decision. We're not going to be, we're going to do this together. So walk us through what the ULERP looks like. How, do, how does that work? Does that happen all at the same time? Do you go one corridor at a time? If one corridor says, ain't not gonna happen, how does the, does the whole thing fall apart? Can you walk us through the, st the strategy for ULERP? I think, I think it's important to, to determine exactly what we are going for a ULERP appro approval and wh what approvals we are asking for. Uh, right now, there's the potential for several different um, 
actions that need Euler approval, um, which could be site selection, because we, we could be, you know. You site selection is just be clear. This is essentially eminent domain. No, site selection is, is to uh, cause a public benefit using city money to be put in place. So if, it's, if there are bonds backstopped by, by city capital money, that Got could it. be a site selection. That's for the financing side. Correct. Um, there, there but you could, did mention that there might be eminent domain. The, the property acquisition certainly could be one of the Euler actions, okay. yes. Um, and then there are, you know, ch changing map streets would be another um, land use associated uh, Euler action. What I think we would do is is go through the different community boards and hold our hearings and go through the ULERP process. It's a bigger one, but one that would ultimately follow a similar process of coming to the city council for their, you know, their votes and their discussions around it. And yes, I mean, if we are unable to get a real consensus that what we're doing is important or if it has an outside effect on one council member versus another, that's, that's a balance we're gonna have to try to strike and, and win the conversation to see the project move forward. And, and council member, I think, um, I think in, in, in response to sort of how would it work as a, as a multi-district, just to kind of elaborate there. I think um, very quickly to, to sort of harken back to the, to the engagement that was done during 2016 and 2017 during some of the studies that we mentioned earlier. Um, I think, you know, it's very important. This is, a, this is a, now an 11 mile corridor. It passes through many different neighborhoods, through many different districts, through diff different community districts, et cetera. So I think, you know, um, one of our goals throughout this process has been to be open and transparent. I think. Uh, during the last round of outreach, we um, had more than 150 external conversations from large public hearings and um, vision visioning sessions to individual briefings. We maintained an open door policy for um, any sort of other community groups or civic organizations that wanted to speak with us about the project. So I think council member, in, in response to sort of forward looking in ULERP, I think um, in advance of the EIS scoping, this uh, what's going to be happening later this year, we look forward to beginning a, another round of public engagement. And I think we would really uh, wanna make sure that we work with you and your office and, and the task force here to ensure that the process that we're going through to um, follow ULERP once we get to that stage, make sure that we, we take into account all of those conversations that we're, that we're having along the way. 11 miles is, is it's a long way, and we wanna make sure that we, we speak with the folks along the corridor who know it best um, in advance of moving through a process like that. Okay, I'm, I'm just, I, I think that, well, we wanna get through the rest of the panels, so I wanna end with this. This conversation was dominated by EDC, just wanna note that. I think we wanna hear more from planning on the transportation side, and so we're hoping that you can get us some of those studies, the underlying studies, to help us share that information with our constituents about how these decisions are made when we look at transportation needs across the boroughs, both Brooklyn and Queens. I think it's a mistake that Sunset Park isn't part of this conversation when we look at alternatives, since BRT will be part of this, and so I hope we can go back and rethink what that looks like even if it's not the BQX to be studied, that the BRT side can be studied and a bus connection. Um, I think that there's fewer, th there, there are fears of gentrification along this corridor that you've seen and are, are beginning to see in parts of the bor uh, borough, uh, both Queens and Brooklyn, that need to be studied and it sounds like it's gonna be studied. Uh, there are questions about the route that you can't answer right now, but are very real, like parking, removing parking, tons of parking. And you might even have that number, and I would be open to hearing that right now. How many parking slot spots are you gonna be removing from all the corridors that include near parks, near NYCHA? Uh, how many parking spots are you removing? Do you have that information now? Is that? I don't have it at my feet. You don't have that? Okay, so these are all still uh, questions. I, I didn't want to dominate the conversation, but I think our report showed about 2,000 uh, parking 2000 spots. Yep. Uh, parking spaces will be removed along the corridor that totally go along yep. places like Atlantic Avenue and other a NYCHA property. And so we want to hear from NYCHA residents about parking, removing parking from streets. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm a supporter of that, by the way, but I want to hear from NYCHA residents about what they think about removing parking from their, from their corridor is going to be. Um, and, and I think what, what was most uh, telling was the cost. Essentially, we're creating this value capture, possible LDC bonds for this infrastructure that we can get faster, potentially faster bus cheaper without value capture, without pushing rates of tax revenue on top of businesses and residents, renters and owners. 
And so this is the kind of analysis that we want to get back to all of you so you can see that with us. And we'll, we'll get that. We'll get that. And, but those are the questions that we wanted to ask of you today. And some of them you had, some of them you're still working on, and we're going to keep working together on that front. Great. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you okay. for having us. Thanks thank you so much. much. We're going to go to the next panel. And again, I want to thank you for your patience for this. We're going to get through this. Uh, we're going to invite the friends of the BQX next on this next panel. Uh, Ms. Jessica Schumer, uh, Christopher Torres. We're going to also invite up uh, the NYU, uh, oh, this is Mitchell Moss, actually, if, we can, if he's still in, in the house. Um, and then uh, Sheckman, Harris Sheckman from Sam Schwartz Engineering to come on up for the next panel to give us a sense about uh, the study and another origin story. And we've also been joined by Councilmember Idanis Rodriguez. Welcome. Not yet. Press the button. If it's red, it's on, and you're ready to go. Thank you. Thank um, you. And bring it closer. If you can bring the mic closer to you. I can move myself closer to the mic. And, your, and yourself and the mic. Perfect. There you there go. Yeah, I think we're in the right Wel place. Welcome to the City Council. Thank you, Council Member. Um, my name is Jessica Schumer, and I'm Executive Director of Friends of the Brooklyn Queens Connector, or BQX. I'm thrilled and thankful the City Council has chosen to hold this hearing and talk to the entire community about an important project for multiple boroughs in the entire city. And I'm excited to be here to speak about it and to answer any questions you might have. The Friends of the BQX is a nonprofit formed four years ago to educate people about the project and help advocate for it. We represent a diverse and broad coalition from trans advocates to public housing residents to community-based organizations to local business groups. As a fourth-generation Brooklynite and new mom to a baby boy who is the fifth generation in Brooklyn to be fifth generation to be born in Brooklyn in my family, I'm incredibly excited about what the BQX could mean for Brooklyn, Queens, and our whole city. Every day, the Friends Group works to engage local communities up and down this corridor. We have found the vast majority of residents, workers, and business owners are open to the idea. People want more transit and they want better transit. We have over 56,000 supporters to date. We're proud they come from all walks of life in our great city, and I'll let Chris talk more about that. The BQX represents the sort of bold and visionary thinking our city needs if we are going to continue to grow equitably and increase opportunity for all New Yorkers. It's our best chance to expand our mass transit system without going through the MTA, which needs to focus, which needs to focus on fixing the system we currently have. The project has the potential to connect this corridor and create a new spine of our city and new affordable transit for the people who need it most. Too many people are struggling and in desperate need of affordable transit. 
There are many areas along the BQX that are not well served by transit and suffer from persistent and high unemployment. Residents in Astoria and Red Hook deserve access to opportunity, and we know that with better transit comes more income mobility. The BQX would not only save people time, but would increase the number of good paying jobs or better schools within commuting distance. There are also places in the nine neighborhoods that the BQX had run through where we're seeing pockets of explosive job and population growth. Downtown Brooklyn, Long Island City, and Williamsburg have mass transit, but mostly in the form of subways that go to and from Manhattan. In discussions with hundreds of residents along the corridor, time and time people say they want to live and work outside of Manhattan. If we don't improve mass transit along this corridor, the current trend of growing transit inequality will continue. Those who can afford to are taking Ubers, Lyfts, private shuttles along the corridor, and those who rely on buses are stuck in slower and slower traffic amid worsening congestion. The BQX would equalize transit with a true dedicated right of way. The BQX will take cars on the, off the road and replace them with reliable, accessible, and affordable mass transit. The BQX would also transform places like the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It currently is home to 10,000 jobs and expects to add an additional 10,000 by 2021 and 10,000 10, more in the coming decades. The Navy Yard has the potential for tremendous job growth, but could grow even more and put more of those jobs in reach with better transportation options. A new ferry stop will help, but that ferry runs from Manhattan to the Navy Yard. Ferries can and should play a role in helping commuters, and their success shows the need for more transit. The BQX can complement other mass transit options like ferries, subways, and buses, and it will carry over five times the number of, compu of commuters served by ferries with a lower operating subsidy. In fact, the operating subsidy required for the BQX is similar to that of subways. One question we see a lot and was addressed earlier, why a streetcar? I think we can all agree that given the cost, there will be very few new subways added in our lifetimes. In many cases, new or improved bus service is the answer to expanding transit access, but not on this corridor, where ridership is projected to be over 16 million a year using a fairly conservative ridership model. That would make the BQX the largest, sorry, largest streetcar line in the country in terms of ridership. And the BQX would have the ability to carry more, car more passengers than most bus lines in the city currently do. Modern streetcars with a dedicated right-of-way provide many of the benefits of a subway, but can be built much more cost-effectively. Yes, the capital costs are higher than a bus line, but they support more density and can move faster with true dedicated rights-of-way that won't be blocked by cars or stop when we need to do underground utility work. They are fully accessible for those with mobility challenges. They are resilient and green. They are cheaper to operate than most forms of mass transit. And they are a way to reimagine and take back our streets and curbs for public transit. The BQX can quite literally help pave the way for more complete and safer streets. And we hope to be the first of a broader network of light rail running on our streets. I know there are still many questions about this project. I can tell you we at Friends of the BQX also have many questions. So I'm glad the council and our entire community is focusing on this project. We believe community engagement is essential to getting this project right, which is why we've spent years discussing the BQX with residents and are glad to see the city pursuing a process that engages the community more through environmental review, ULERP, and other types of outreach. I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, council member, for having us. Um, my name is Christopher Torres. I'm the deputy director of Friends of the BQX, or the Brooklyn Queens Connector. So I grew up in Southern California where access to quality transportation was always lacking. Having to use public transit was difficult. In fact, it's part of the reason why I chose to move, New York, move to New York City, is because of the, our massive, all-encompassing 24-hour transit system. Um, I lived here for about 15 years now, and the frustration from delays, overcrowding, and lack of maintenance reminded me of how, how hard it was getting around when I was younger. And um, I know I'm not alone in saying that we have to do better and we can do better. If Los Angeles can add a modern, reliable streetcar to its public transit options, this city should be, this city should be able to do so as well. That's why I'm excited to be part of an organization working hard to create new mass trans transit options to get around Brooklyn and Queens. Over the last 13 years in New York City and nationwide, I've devoted myself to progressive causes, fighting for others on issues like the New York State Dream Act, raising the minimum wage, and clean and fair elections. And now I'm fighting for something else that I believe should be a fundamental right to our city, is access to affordable and reliable transportation. I believe in building grassroots power in communities and that when it comes to the betterment of people's lives, we all have the responsibility to do the hard work of finding solutions, even when the fruit of that labor is not immediate. In my experience, difficult problems require sitting down at the table to find common ground and listening to people for input. The work that the Friends has done over the last four years to educate New Yorkers about the BQX is, is real and widespread. That work includes on knocking on 48,000 doors, 
gathering 7,333 signatures through support of, through one-on-one -on -one conversations, including 1,742 signatures coming specifically from NYCHA, 1,600 signatures coming from Sunset Park while we were down there. Um, these supporters are not just signing their name, they elected to share their letter of support with their neighbors and to be printed in local newspapers. In total, we have collected signups from 57,221 New Yorkers, including 510 new supporters in the last three weeks while leading up to this hearing, who at one point or another showed interest in engaging with friends of the BQX to make, this a, to make this project a success. This spring, more than 100 small business owners from along the corridor attended an event we organized focused on a how, the, how a streetcar would impact business, both during and post-construction. Small, bu small business owners from around the city joined us and talked about their exper experiences. They talked about enduring the construction and change that comes with building a streetcar, but the resounding refrain was that access to mass transit is good for business. More than 25 local businesses signed up to be part of our local business working group. A poll we conducted of voters who live along the corridor found that nearly 75% support the BQX, including 71% of those who live in public housing. 16% of voters we spoke to were opposed to the project. The Friends Outreach Team has done a lot of listening. Overwhelmingly, we hear from residents that movement up and down the corridor is unacceptably slow and unreliable. They want the BQX to cost the same as a subway and include a free transfer. They want to make sure it can actually move in NYC traffic and has a dedicated right away. Among the many obstacles stacked low, against low-income and working-class New Yorkers, a lack of reliable and affordable transportation is one of the most difficult to overcome. In 2015, the New York Times quoted a study by a Harvard economist who looked at nine U.S. cities, including New York City. He wrote, the relationship between transportation and social mobility is stronger than between mobility and several other factors, like crime, elementary school test scores, or the percentage of two-parent family, two families in a community. Along the BQX door, corridor, we're talking about giving 44,000 NYCHA residents better access to tens of thousands of jobs along the Brooklyn Queens waterfront. And it's not just NYCHA residents who will benefit from the opportunities the BQX will provide. Over half the residents along the route live in some form of rent protected and affordable housing. We're talking about an ADA accessible single ride from Astoria to downtown Brooklyn in the Navy Yard. It will have a dedicated right of way that will further protect, further protect pedestrians and cyclists and that's something we desperately need as this year's fatalities by car continue to rise. I understand that the prospect is daunting of building a new mode of transit that will hopefully lead to a broader citywide network. Progress is measured in years, but I also know that this council understands reliable, accessible transportation is crucial to improving the lives of residents in their districts. I believe that this is the council that can help energize this ambitious project, show leadership when our city needs it most, and make sure we get this historic project right. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. <clears throat> My name is Harris Schechtman, and I'm senior principal at Sam Schwartz Engineering, a transportation and planning firm. I was formerly general manager for buses and head of operations planning and schedules for New York City Transit Department of Buses. I am here today to testify in support of the Brooklyn Queens Connector, a project that will have a crucial impact on sustaining the ongoing growth the Brooklyn Queens waterfront has experienced while allowing it to mature into a thriving corridor for both residential and commercial uses. Sam Schwartz, AKA Gridlock Sam and former New York City Traffic Commissioner shares my views and endorses this statement. Our firm did the original alternatives analysis, feasibility study, and conceptual design for Friends of the BQX. That project determined that BQX was feasible, but could only succeed with the higher capacity that a modern streetcar could provide. And this was based on projected daily ridership higher than any bus route in New York City and likely the highest daily ridership of any streetcar in the United States. From the time BQX emerged as a proposed streetcar, critics have questioned why it could not be a BRT or in New York lingo, an SBS service. They cite how much cheaper SBS could be comparing it as a bus route without the infrastructure investments necessary for higher speed and reliability. 
They also ignore history. For some 60 years, New York City Transit ran buses over a similar route called B61. That route took as long as 90 minutes, averaging six miles an hour end to end. But that was on paper. In reality, frequent delays led to bunching and service gaps and unbearably slow trips that drove riders away as service became unmanageable. In response, New York City Transit split this into two separate routes about 10 years ago. Why repeat the failure of B61 with another bus alternative? Critics often overlook the fact that even the highest capacity bus that could be used on this service has only about half the passenger capacity of the BQX's proposed modern streetcars. Of course, that means higher bus operating cost, but the bigger problem is that buses would have to run every one to two minutes to meet passenger demand. Traffic signal timing, uneven loading, et cetera, will guarantee that even if buses leave the terminal on time, within a short distance, the bus service will become bunched and irregular on almost every trip. Without the ability to run reliably and smoothly, the service will fail from day one if it is an SBS. <clears throat> this may all sound too technical, but I can say as a lifelong New Yorker, as you can probably tell from my accent, who has planned, scheduled, studied, operated, and advocated for our New York City bus network for over 50 years, that buses cannot be the answer for this robust yet underserved Brooklyn Queens waterfront corridor. This is not about nostalgia to bring back the trolley. Our firm was a key player in the eight year long project that designed and implemented the first five and very successful SBS routes to ever operate in New York City. Elsewhere, we have advocated for BRT in lieu of proposed modern streetcars where that was the right solution. We support bus solutions where appropriate, but in this corridor, buses won't cut it. So streetcar is the right choice, but why do we need this route at all? The combination of job, residential, and recreational growth along this corridor is key to New York City's future. Some 40,000 residents of public housing along this route will find well-paying opportunities in the future economy and a vastly expanded area within New York City that now becomes within a reasonable commuting distance of their homes. The mixing of their needs with those of residents of new developments is not a bad thing. That multi-use broad spectrum of demands is what makes New York City's transit routes the most used and useful in the country. We cannot tap that potential without this streetcar spine that connects people and jobs with much shorter travel times. Currently, many trips along this corridor actually take less time if one improbably takes the subway into Manhattan and comes back out. This encourages residents to crowd onto overcapacity subways entering Manhattan instead of attracting them to a faster, more direct route on the streets. What happens if we don't build BQX? Residents are going to find another way to get around. And as the last five years have shown, that way is often going to be TNCs or FHVs. We are already seeing the consequences in Manhattan where increased auto mileage is slowing everyone down now to the speed of buses. The newly enacted congestion pricing program will hopefully bring some relief to Midtown, but we need innovation elsewhere to avoid the environmental and travel consequences. The best way to win customers to transit is to provide an attractive competitive service. The frequency and reliability of BQX will mean that residents can likely go to the nearest BQX station and board a streetcar in the same or less time than they would wait for an Uber or Lyft. The signal and lane priorities that will be available only to BQX streetcars will further cement its role. And customers will enjoy that reliability and fixed fare of BQX 
even when it's raining or snowing. There is no better option on the horizon. The city's adoption of BQX is a bold, insightful, and strategic move. MTA's capital burden for state of good repair, modernization, and very limited expansion leaves it, as a practical matter, unable to consider BQX regardless of its merits. The innovative value capture financing proposed for this project is a model widely used in other countries and can ensure that, unlike Second Avenue Subway, enhanced real estate values can be put toward a public good. The BQX would reduce personal car usage as well and offer improved streetscape opportunities, an improved path towards Vision Zero, a cleaner environment, and reinforcement of a future that does not require car ownership. For these reasons and more, I support BQX as an effective transit strategy for the Brooklyn Queens waterfront and for the entire city, and hope that I have helped your understanding of that. BQX can stand alone on its transit merits, but more than that, it is an investment in our long-term future, diversifying our growth geographically and capitalizing on and sustaining the attention the waterfront has gained. Thank you. Thank you for that analysis. We're gonna, we're gonna come back to you and, and I wanna start with the, the friends of the BQX. Thank you for your testimony today and the work that, that you've done uh, on the engagement. I want to I want to really get your sense of the origin story, if you will. Uh, we talked about the origin story of this committee, EDC, when they started. When was the Friends of of BQX organization founded? What year? Um, it was before my time. I believe it was 2015. But yes, we're four years old, so 2015. 2015. 2015. Uh, but are you sh are you sure about that? I believe it's 2015. I. Want okay. To triple check and confirm. Okay. Yes. Let's and let's see if we can. If someone's out there that with that information, if you can get that to Ms. Schumer, sure. that'd be great. Um, and then who founded that organization? Um, who, who Friends found? of the BQX was founded by a group of um, folks, obviously within Brooklyn and Queens. Um, so we have obviously our chair is Jed Valentis. The Brooklyn Chamber was involved. Um, We've got, our board represents a diverse group of people. We've got several NYCHA leaders on our board, community-based organizations. We can get you a full board list. Um, a lot of people are out on the front, on the Step City Hall today. Um, and so, yeah, we've got, that was, that was the founding board. And we've had a few people come on and off, but it's been a core group since then. And 2015, so, we're confirming. Well, what's it, 2015? 2015. 2015. Uh, any, like, month or? Let's see if we'll, we can we'll get, get Okay, see so if we can get, just so we can get a sense of, yeah. of timing and, mm -hmm. December 2015 is different from January 2015. So let's just see if we can get that. Uh, and and so this included, it sounds like, nonprofits, mm -hmm. Brooklyn Chamber, business et cetera. Business organizations. Business organizations, uh, yes. developers as well, as you said, NYCHA. Mm -hmm. So NYCHA and was at the table at the beginning in 2015. Again, I joined the group in February of 2017, so I don't want to speak to exactly what happened. It's my understanding, but I will, we can find that out. Okay, again, these are, these are gonna be important of pieces. And what was the goal of the organization, if you if you understand that or if you know that? I mean, the goal in the founding in the found. What was the goal? So the, in the origin of moment? the BQX came from. Um, we're submitting some testimony. Um, in 2005, uh, Alex Gardman, who was a former city planner, had done some work and looked at this, and we have a letter from him. Um, and then in, I believe it was April of 2014, although again, I'm not sure about the month, Michael Kimmelman wrote a story in the New York Times that laid out this vision of a streetcar along the Brooklyn and Queens waterfront. Um, after that, obviously, that got some interest from, from members who would go on to found the Friends of the BQX. Um, they did some work to make sure that this was actually a real, or to see how real this, this idea could be, um, because it was so intriguing. Um, and that article and the subsequent work that was done to actually see if there was any, uh, if it was both possible and practical, um, led to the formation of the Friends of the Brooklyn Queens Connector. And and that so it sounds like there's there's some ideas that kind of popped up in the press, and a group formed, and then there was. You said an ask of, or not an ask, but a question. Can can is this feasible? Mm -hmm. So was there? How was that question asked? And was there funding that was connected to that? 
ask of the question. So again, this is a study that was yes, done? Yes, there was a study I know done by Sam Schwartz. They did the original study, um, and we can get that to you as well to look at the feasibility and to actually really explore if this was. And that's what Mr. Schechtman just spoke just to. Just referenced, exactly. Okay. And when was that study done? Um, 2015, 2016. 2015. Pretty, pretty much uh, finished, I think, in January of 2016. Okay, so end of 2015 and into 2016. And how was the organization then, how did the organization pay for that to get Mr. Schechtman and, and? So this again was before my time, so let me, I wanna get the correct okay. answer to you. So I will. We'll okay, if you can, that'd yeah. be great. In real time, we're gonna have a few questions here. We, we wanna come back to that. And, um, and then essentially, Mr. Schechtman, who hired you? Who was the entity that hired you? to do this work? The, the friends did. That. Okay, so it was, a, it was a contract between the friends of the BQX and... Sam Schwartz. And Sam Schwartz right. Incorporated. Okay, great. Do you have a sense, I'm gonna come back to you. Do um, you have a sense of how much money has been spent since the beginning of the organization um. on, on studies first, on studies? It sounds like this is the only study that you, that you conducted. We've We've looked into some other minor studies, but this was the main one. And how much did that study cost? Again, I'm sorry, I, I will look. I just, I joined the organization okay. two years so after this study was basically done. Totally understand. So. If, if there's anybody, if there's yep. a board member out there listening, it'd be great to get that information. Otherwise, we're gonna put a big question mark on that. Um, and then, how much money have you spent thus far on outreach and doing kind of outreach campaign work? So we've, I mean, it's hard to break down exactly because obviously, you know, we have all of our expenses are somewhat linked. Um, we have staff that's doing outreach, we do other outreach work, but I would say we spend a majority of our budget, a majority of our, our funds on outreach um, and staff. And well. what is the budget? What is the annual budget? And do you have, do you have a breakdown? I don't of have annual? a breakdown in front of me. Um, we will, I don't want to give you a wrong number, so let me. Yeah, we want. We don't want to get it wrong over there. I don't want to get it wrong. No. I don't want to get the number wrong. Uh, okay, so then you're going to get us information yep. about mm -hmm. what your, you don't have it right now, what your yearly funding has been. And I'm assuming there's like yearly audits and stuff that yes, you put of course, together. We, yes, and that, we have 990 and all that. So. Okay, again, we want to get a sense about, about what mm -hmm. has been raised. Do you have a sense about what's been raised thus far? Uh, again, let me get you. I want to be precise in our. In our okay. Okay, so maybe the rest of the questions I won't be a, won't, won't ask because they're all related to this okay. this funding. Um, let's move over to you, uh, Mr. Schechtman. and you were hired to have a conversation or a, a, not a conversation, an analysis. And if we could maybe uh, have a a planning scenario here, sure, because you laid out some very specific information that I think is important for us to unpack a little bit and think about together in terms of comparing the BQX to a BRT or SBS, a bus, essentially, a bus or a light rail. And I think that a lot of the facts that you presented are not incorrect. I think they're very, they're very correct information. But I'm not sure that they're completely, um, uh, well, before I make the judgment, let's walk <laughs> through some of the questions that I have for you. So the assumption here that we are moving forward with on the BQX is that the BQX will be a line that has, and I wrote down the things that you are kind of pointing to, and I think I have them memorized, dedicated lanes, um, which will require us to move, remove parking. So in a world where we remove the 2,000 plus parking spaces, which I'm in support of, uh, and I think the community is supportive, right? Uh, we remove the parking spaces. We have dedicated lanes for for the rail. Then you have signal priorities that allow for the train to move through and up and down the corridor. And in that world, you get fast light rail, correct? Correct. And you compared it to a B61 line that doesn't exist anymore because it got broken up and it took it took forever to get from well, one. Half of it exists. Say that again. Half of it exists. The other half, half of it exists. Cold. Well, and I know the other B61. half is B62. Well, the original route does not exist. Right. It exists in pieces, and one of them goes through my neighborhood, and I know that very well. <laughs> I, I, I take it home. Okay. But that comparison might not be 
completely accurate because if you essentially create, and walk me through this as a planner, walk me through what it look, would look like if we had that same route with dedicated lanes, signal priority, uh, and, and there's the, essentially the, the mechanics of off-board payment mm -hmm. for a bus, and would you still have that same 60-minute situation on a bus if you compare it to the BQX and the infrastructure that the BQX would have? Minus the cost. So there's nothing that you can't, you can't argue the cost. The co it's more, more expensive to build a BQX than it is to put a bus down. But would you still hold that to be true, that a B61 that's improved with all the things that have the fixings of a BQX, that you would still have a 90-minute disaster? No, I don't think you would have 90 minutes. You might have 80 minutes. But the, the okay. issue here is, and, and let me go back to that. Yeah, I'll walk go, me through it. So compare, I, I know so it's just a, a quick little behind the envelope, transportation analyst. Okay. What would then, how would you make that determination about essentially a bus on a BQX fixings versus a BQX. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, our firm was a key player in the first five, designing the first five SBSs for the city. This corridor, except perhaps for the 21st Street in Astoria section, which does, we heard from Costa talk a little bit about that. <laughs> does, does not have the attributes of a successful SBS. It has narrow streets, often one lane in each direction, sometimes um, in, in one area of, of Red Hook, not even technically one lane in each direction. And what this all, and you combine that, okay, which means a, a loss of flexibility. You combine that with a one to two minute headway that even assuming the largest articulated buses that you can get today, at one to two minutes, I, I don't think I'm bringing anything new up here to say that bunching is the bane of, of New York bus service. Uh, I ran that service. I tried to, uh, to improve that for years. It is a tough, tough cookie. When you run buses at one to two minutes, you may succeed in having them leave the terminal on time. But because some of the traffic signal phases are longer than a minute, it's impossible to keep the buses spaced evenly. And one of the reasons why bunching is so difficult to cure is that once buses become bunched, it's very, very difficult. I don't, I don't want to say impossible. It's very, very difficult to separate them again. And you have. And what causes bunching exactly? Are you talking about? It, it, it's, it's caused by a variety. Uh, sometimes it's even driver behavior. Sometimes it's the timing of signals. Sometimes it's uneven loading of buses. So even with signal priority, you still get bunches. Oh, absolutely. And then, so then how does the BQX get around the bunching? Because the key is the BQX can carry the same number of people running every four minutes, let's say. Maybe five, but let's say four. And that spacing keeps the vehicles from bunching. In other words, when you're a minute apart, it's impossible. And that's why I say once you leave the terminal, it's... It's impossible to go 11 miles and not have those buses start going back to back. With a, with a four minute frequency, you, you can manage the service better. And, and that's the key. And, and you ask the right question. You ask the right question, which we looked at in the study. I, l let me backtrack because I, I, I saw you were kind of curious about something. Let me take the curiosity out. We were not hired by the friends to design a streetcar. We were hired to look at this corridor, determine what the demand was, and then essentially do an alternatives analysis to decide what was the best way to tap and meet that demand. So we extensively looked at BRT. Obviously, we're quite expert in that. 
And we as a firm, and I try to convey that in the testimony, are mode agnostic. We're not a streetcar firm that lives to design streetcar systems. We're a transit and transportation firm that looks for the best solution. That's why we call ourselves mode agnostic. And that's what we're trying to figure out as well. And that's why we're, we're, we're trying to have this conversation that allows us to hear from you directly and, and have an honest comparison between the, which did, did not come out in your testimony. So if there's more information that you can have in comparisons to a BQX versus a dedicated lane, signal priority, bus infrastructure that allows us to remove the cars and have bus, bus dedicated corridor up and down today, that, that's what we're looking for. And it sounds like you might have already done that, that analysis. And if you've done that analysis, we'd appreciate that you share that with the committee. The, the study that you'll be getting a copy of will give you a full picture of, of how we looked at all of this. That, that would be super helpful. Right. That's going to help us. And, and, and by the way, we looked at more than just uh, streetcar or BRT. We looked at a lot of other modes, which fell out pretty quickly is not great. Well, we haven't had the luxury sorry. of looking at it, so it'd be great sure. to share that with the committee and the rest of the members, who I think are going to be very curious about, about that one question uh, as we kind of compare alternatives right. here. EDC is going to be doing their thing, but it'd be great to have right. a sense of how you created that origin mm -hmm. understanding for everybody that, uh, that you're engaging with here today. So the other thing I, I want to convey is, you know, much of my career was in the bus end of the business, okay? I consider myself to be an expert. I also consider myself to be an advocate. And believe me, when we looked at the BRT alternative, it was not with any baggage, okay? If there was a way from my years of experience with buses and with SBS, if there was a way that we could have designed a service that I could say with confidence mm. would achieve the goals of this corridor, it would have been there. It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. okay? And I want to just appreciate that as an engineer and I think you're the first engineer that has kind of spoken. I'm a planner. I'm a planner, not an engineer. A planner. Right. A planner. Uh, did I read engineer somewhere? Uh, a planner. Fir the firm is it. The firm is an engineer right. firm. You're the planner. Right. Thank you so much for, for, for making the case. And, and I think that's what we wanted to hear from a planner. And that's who we want to hear from in this. And I think that's what the community wants to hear from as well <coughs> when we think about infrastructure uh, well, as well, big as this. Well, one of the, I'll call it a slogan that I use, is a bargain is not a bargain if what you get is worth nothing. Mm. So yes, the cost of doing this as an SBS, even a, uh, a full flowering SBS, is less than doing it as a streetcar. Mm -hmm. But no matter how we twist and turn that, on day one, the service is gonna fail. And it's, it's, uh, it's not gonna please anybody to say we saved $500 million if on day one someone goes out there and says, this reminds me of the old B61. Right, nobody wants that, <laughs> one. Two, this isn't just about cost, and it's not 500 million that we're talking in the billions. And then three, this isn't just about cost, it's about time, and they're with, a. Reynoso talked a little bit about 100,000 people coming in in the next few years. Uh, we need an answer now. And, and I think, and this is maybe to the friends of, uh, and I can talk to Ms. 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 Schumer here about what, um, in the work that you're doing on the engagement side, essentially, we're not just saying BQX only. It sounds like you're looking at transportation solutions now. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you can kind of glean from the data that you're getting from people is that people would want good transportation and want, they want better transportation than what they have now. Can you, can you expand on that, either you or, or Mr. Torres? Um, sure. I mean, I think when you go out there and we're talking to folks, whether it be, you know, along the corridor at a picnic or in NYCHA housing at a picnic, family days. I think that the need for better transportation is there. And I don't really think the, 
the public really cares what, what the form is. Um, I think because we've been informed by the studies and the Friends of the BQX was created out of the, the idea that a light rail is the best version of moving people. Um, you know, that's, that's how we reframe the conversation, right? So I think that people want to get around the best way possible. And um, through our studies, we say the BQX is the right way. So. The other thing I'll add is when we talk to people, what we hear a lot, um, they want to make sure that this is going to cost the same as a subway or a bus. And the city has said it will, and we think it should. And they also want to make sure there'll be a free transfer, which we think is very important. If there's no free transfer, we don't think this, this works in the way it needs to for people. And, and I think that's, and that, that, might have, that may have already been over said in the press, this idea that this is still a standalone piece of infrastructure, unless we get the MTA to say yes. And that's, those are political wins. wins. Can you talk a little bit about that strategy? How, how do you get the mayor and the governor to talk? I, I, one's not even in the city most of the time, and, and the other, whatever. Like, um, how, what's this, what, literally, what is the strategy to make that happen? So we are still obviously thinking that through. It's a little, I mean, it's, we're not there yet. Hopefully, we will be soon. Um, we, some of the th barriers that will be helpful um, to making that happen are the phasing out of the Metro card. So you have this new technology coming in. Um, we believe the Metro card will be phased out by the time BQX will be up and running. Um, but, you know, we've heard, I think the city has said, and they said here today, that they believe a free transfer should happen. So we're hoping that there is political will to make that happen. And we will be advocating for it using all the tools that we have to advocate for it. You and me and everyone we know. And we would hope you and, the, and everyone else would as well. So, yes. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think that's it. Okay. We're going to move on to our next panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. We're going to bring up, if you're in the house, the Atlantic Avenue bid, Lori Morez. The New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, Renee Reynolds. Transit Center, David uh, Brugdon, and then Miss uh, Miss Amy uh, Breedlove from the Cobble Hill Association. If you can come on up. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, Transit Center, New York Justice, uh, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. No. Here. Oh yeah. Sorry, Renee. Yeah, you're here. Sorry. I mean, Atlantic Avenue bid. That's me. That both of you are here. Okay. So these two. Okay. Cobble Hill Association is not here anymore. No. She had to leave. Okay. Great. Uh, floor is yours. Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity. <clears throat> My name is Lori Mora, and I'm here to represent the Atlantic Avenue bid. Uh, but I'd also like to represent myself, because I've lived in Cobble Hill for more than 50 years, and I own a building on Atlantic Avenue along the route of the proposed trolley. There may be one or two people in this room who also share something else with me. I grew up in Brooklyn with trolleys. I know all about trolleys, fixed rail vehicles. I know firsthand how inconvenienced they were to get in and out of. I know how they often bunched up and got in trouble with vehicles uh, regular free ve vehicles, and that they often had power losses. But 
Then the city decided that wasn't such a good mode of transportation, so they changed them to trolley buses. The trolley buses were much, much more flexible, and they ran on the same power lines as the trolleys, and they were much, much better, but um, they also had issues. They often lost the power and other such things, so then what happened? We got real buses, buses. I grew up along Utica Avenue, and the B46 bus is still running along Utica Avenue, and it was a much, much improved situation. And now, with really good buses, ones that are non-polluting, uh, buses seem like a very good idea. So it was absolutely amazing to me to see that a trolley, a fixed rail vehicle, was now being proposed to run through one of the most densely developed areas of Brooklyn, and that <clears throat> we would, we, it was completely inflexible. I can't speak about other areas, but I can speak about my own area. That is the corner of Atlantic and Court Street, which no one who planned this route ever went there. They would have seen all our buses, the famous 61 bus, the 63 bus, the 57, uh, other, other, lots of trucks, lots of cars, everything like that, and lots of people crossing Atlantic Avenue. A trolley making a turn on that corner would be a disaster, and we know that 70% of the dedicated routes will be for this trolley, and maybe Court Street may even be one of them. And we now learned about value captured. These are not areas that are afraid of being gentrified. They have been gentrified for years. There are two historic neighborhoods through which this trolley would pass. And it is really unfair to think that these neighborhoods would benefit in any way, these neighborhoods, not other neighborhoods, but these neighborhoods would benefit from this trolley. I think it's amazing that we'd be asked to pay for something which would not only not benefit us, but would have a very great negative impact on our neighborhoods. No one would question the need for improved transportation both in Queens and in Red Hook. Uh, the 61 bus is not as bad as the guy says it is, but they could do much, much better. I think that ex an expensive, inflexible, fixed rail system is certainly not the answer, certainly not for our neighborhood. Additional new bus roads, routes, whether they are SBSs, BRT, no matter how fancy, no matter how new and modern they are, should certainly be the answer for our neighborhood and for these other neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And before, before Renee, you go, um, can I ask, does anybody grow up in New York City that saw rail, uh, light rail in the city. Trolleys? In, I'm just asking if anybody would, like you grew up oh. with light rail uh, in the city. Nobody here, okay. Well, that was so beautiful and special that we heard from. The woman. Yes? Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So there's another, another person that, that's experienced it. Thank you so much for sharing that. That was, that was beautiful. Renee. Thanks. Um, so good morning, my name is Renee Reynolds. I'm the transportation planner for the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance and I'm here on behalf of my organization and our membership network. Um, we are a citywide membership network of grassroots organizations uh, uh, from low income neighborhoods and communities of color. Uh, and so our work focuses on the struggles uh, for environmental justice and that includes transportation justice. Um, so many people have already said um, how 
uh, important it is that we have equitable transportation. We can't argue that that is a need. Um, but I want to take the opportunity to highlight one thing, uh, an issue that I haven't heard come up today, and that's the issue of uh, living in a coastal city in the context of climate change. So Superstorm Sandy wreaked havoc on our coastlines. Everyone uh, is aware of that, and it laid bare the reality of uh, climate change. And in just this past week, we had ha uh, hail storms in uh, Staten Island, and tornado warnings, and flood warnings. And so it's amazing and unf unfathomable that in 2019, uh, with the extreme ev weather events as our new reality that EDC is proposing a fixed rail system on, uh, on our surface level and on our waterfront. It makes no sense. Um, and while EDC's reporting has claimed that a small portion of the BQX would be within the 100-year uh, floodplain, it doesn't account for the fact that the majority of the line is within the storm surge zone. Um, and so we don't need to wait 100 years to find out that the BQX is an ill-conceived project. We know it now. Um, and since the inception of this project, our member organization Uprose in Sunset Park has been pushing back and asking critical questions. Why a trolley when we have multiple train lines? Why a trolley when we can reactivate um, bus lines? Um, and so the answer is that the BQX project is not about transportation. It is about real estate development. It is a project marketed to vulnerable communities who understandably are in search for better transit but are unaware that they are being sold snake oil. The price tag for the project has ballooned to nearly $3 billion, and the route has been shortened. And the city cannot continue to, uh, to expend vital resources that could be utilized, that could fix transit gaps now, not 10 years from now when the BQX would be complete and in operation. Who's waiting until 20, um, 29 to, uh, to get to work on time? People can uh, get to work on time if we close those gaps now, and the easiest and most cost-effective way to do that is to improve our bus networks. Um, so I feel that we need to stop this project in its tracks right now, <laughs> to um, use another transportation pun, but I, I, I also think that we need support from our elected officials, and I'm so glad that the council has um, uh, brought us here to, uh, to respond to this proposal, to ask the critical questions about what are the right investments and, and for whom they serve. Um, so I want to thank the city council. I want to thank the task force on BQX. And I look forward to us being much more critical about developers with value capture schemes and pretty renderings that actually don't il illustrate what the true picture of the project is. And, and I also want to highlight one other thing about the project. Um, so value capture is obviously extremely speculative. Um, but one of the things that you see in the reporting is that this rail system would also require overhead contact systems to run on, right? These are wires that would then need to be included. Um, so with construction, uh, uh, chaos, with the laying of rail tr uh, tracks, hanging wires, and creating exclusionary trolley streets, uh, and f then potentially forfeiting public land for substations, I, I think it's um, insanity, and I think we need support in um, stopping this misadventure as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I have a, a couple questions, if I can, before you leave. Um, how did you each hear about the BQX? How, how did you hear about it? Oh, a long time ago. A couple of years ago, uh, a representative, I guess, came to the Atlantic Avenue bid. And was this an EDC person? Or I, may, I think it probably was. I don't even remember. It was at least two or three years ago. Okay. And at that point, I expressed amazement at the idea of a, quote, trolley mm. because of the total inflexibility of it. We did not know the route then. If we would have known the route that it was actually planning to go I make a turn from Court Street and go west on Atlantic Avenue until 
It got to Columbia Street and make a turn through two or three of the most important blocks of our district. We wouldn't have been calm and quiet about it. I mean, we would have been much, much more upset then. And in all candor, when you talk to the local elected officials, our councilmen, the two that we bridge, they weren't even sure it was really going to happen. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you took this seriously, you know, marching with placards and all that, didn't seem necessary at that time. That was before the Friends of BQX. Mm. Okay. And the funding and the promotion. In my opinion now, it's absolutely necessary. We need our own placards and our own buttons and our own, you know, efforts in order to stop this, as, as Renee says. Well, and before I go to Renee, um I wanted to ask you one more, last thing about, about essentially, the, we, we've jotted down and noted your issues on the turns, and that's going to be important for this conversation, especially for businesses along the corridor. What I haven't heard necessarily is of whether or not the Atlantic bid has business concerns around construction. You heard the EDC say, well, we decided not to go to Sunset Park because of the disruption on small businesses and because of cost. But they mention that as one of the notes. Well, T what's the disruption for businesses? Well, um, it's tremendous, of course. W what is w what is that? What is your expectation that that's going to cause? It, it. We have a shop on Atlantic Avenue there. The ability for UPS to come, <laughs> the ability for customers to come. And is that just through construction? So after oh, the construction. Oh well, that's no. Afterwards, look. There's only. I'm, I can only talk about our route. I, I'm not, I can't really talk about And that's about all it. I'm asking you, just okay. to look at Atlantic We have only Avenue. one stop proposed in what is technically along our route. That is the corner of Court and Atlantic Avenue. The absolute worst place in the world, if anybody ever saw that, but that's what's planned. So we, meaning the business people, are hardly going to terrifically benefit from this traf this trolley because they'd be walking, what, three blocks to our shop, my daughter's shop, or six blocks the other way. It's not like, you know, the present famous <laughs> B61. Uh, and so the, the length of construction, of course, is terrible. But more to that point is the end, the end result where stores cannot be, businesses cannot get their deliveries. Who no, we don't even know what's going to happen with the existing bus lines. We don't know what would happen with an ambulance. We have a medical center, you know, down there. Mm -hmm. um, we have no, none of those things. All we know is that our present situation along Atlantic Avenue is one of the most heavily trafficked streets in this city. And to impose upon that a fixed rail vehicle is, is absolutely amazing. Thank you for that. And I, I just wanted to make sure that that voice was in and, and, and moving over to Renee and, and the work you, you've been doing and the organization and the coalition uh, including Uprose, talking about climate change. I know we didn't mention it because we were really focused on things that we just hadn't been uh, uh, privy to in, mm -hmm. in terms, of, terms of information. It's not lost on us. The climate change question is a real question. Is th are there studies that you can share with us or information about light rail in terms of impacts from storm, uh, be it uh, water or whatever whatever kind of impacts light, light rail has had is that is that information that you can share with us at a later time or if you have now that that kind of shows the uh the vulnerability and the resiliency issues around a fixed infrastructure like this yeah so unfortunately i'm not aware of a study that would give like a comparison of like a, a city like new york's 
New York. Um, so I could definitely look and see if I can find uh, something that would give a, a clearer picture. Uh, I mean, this is simply something that can be observed and understood. Like, if you have a fixed rail system and there is a storm event, uh, in, in their own reporting, they've indicated that it, their response, their climate resiliency response would be to park it, you know, so it wouldn't even be an operable system. Let's say a tree falls down on the rail, you know, like we're talking about bunching because of signals, but what, anything else can happen to impede that rail line. And a bus can make a turn and reroute. A, a fixed rail system can't do that. Got it. That's pretty clear. Uh, okay. Thank you both for being here Thank today you. and for your testimony. Thanks. We're moving on to our next panel, the New York Building Congress, Joseph Colella, TWU Local 100, uh, DeVay Williams, the Waterfront Alliance, Roland Lewis, uh, and then, uh, did you guys fill out a, you down? Okay. Building, the building. Can we have both of you guys up here as well? I'll find you. Uh, who wants to start? Sure. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you, council member. It takes a lot of endurance to sit through hearings and to uh, keep a clear mind. So appreciate I was, it. I was born for this. <laughs> I was born for this. Go ahead. Um, my name is Joseph Colella, and I'm here to read a statement on behalf of Carlos Secura, Scusura and the New York Building Congress. Uh, the Building Congress is a nonpartisan coalition of business, labor, professional, and governmental organizations serving the design, construction, and real estate industry. Uh, our association is made up of over 550 organizations comprised of more than 250,000 professionals. On behalf of the Building Congress, I urge the City Council to make the Brooklyn Queens connector a reality. For New York to continue to thrive as a global city, we've got to dream big and put shovels in the ground. I implore this council to return to a spirit of aspirational planning and building that transformed New York into the city it is today. With the BQX, New York City is taking a 21st century approach to infrastructure planning. The city no longer operates on the hub and spoke model we've experienced in previous decades. And there are very real opportunities in the boroughs outside of Manhattan that should be accessible for all New Yorkers. If you live or work in a part of Queens or Brooklyn that isn't currently adequately served by mass transit, you deserve the same access to jobs and housing as those on the Upper West Side or Midtown. The current efforts to improve our existing transit are critical, but they do not reflect this principle. All New Yorkers deserve equal service. The BQX would catalyze new development and retail, all the while being mindful and inclusive of the neighborhoods that have been virtually cut off from opportunity since their inception. The project will also boost the number of available jobs and expand access for many minority and women-owned businesses. We need to grow our city inclusively, and the BQX is one of the most promising projects to do just that. Furthermore, this project will serve as a crucial blueprint for future transit investment by using value capture to fund part of the cost. This financing model is a proven approach to reducing the budget impacts of large-scale infrastructure construction. Uh, we urge you to support this transformative project and welcome the improved transit fall of New York. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm glad you were built for this, uh, council member. <laughs> uh, thank you, members of city council, for holding this hearing today on an important topic that deserves attention. My name is Santos Rodriguez, and I am here to testify on behalf of Gary LaBarbera, president of the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York comprising local affiliates of 15 national and international trade unions, representing more than 100,000 hardworking men and women living in New York City. I'm here to testify in support of the BQX, and I am thankful to the city for their promise to construct the, that the construction of this 11-mile light rail line along the Brooklyn-Queens waterfront will be built by union labor. 
I'm proud to say that the, I am a supporter of the BQX, and let me tell you three reasons why you should be too. Jobs, jobs, and jobs. From union construction jobs, from building the light rail line, which estimated to be around 16,000, to the jobs that will be created with new housing and office buildings that the light rail will enable, we're talking about thousands and thousands of job opportunities for New Yorkers. The BQX, as planned, will be one of the largest light rail projects in America. If done correctly, it can spur new and important development projects like affordable housing along a route and can serve as an example that New York City can still do big things. The city should move this project forward to prove that it can build out our transit system in a new intelligent way and that it can take control of its transit destiny. Our members are eager and ready to go to work. We really are waiting just we really are just waiting on you to get behind this project so we can spend, speed it through the public process review. It would be better for the communities you represent, for our workers in the city, if we can get this to yes quickly to avoid the pain and headaches of the willing, the willing they, won't they, build transit and create jobs. We unfortunately seen that many of the same organizations that complain to represent Working people yell, scream about the BQX, giving false reason for opposing it, like that is not no guarantee to be integrated with the MTA fare system. Well, of course it will be integrated. It's not guaranteed because it hasn't been built yet. It makes sense the, the city and state integrated. This is the single best transit project of the city of New York, currently has in front of it, and it would serve thousands of people while creating thousands of jobs tens of thousands of jobs. Our members of the Building and Construction Trades Council are ready to go to work with you and the city to fast track this project and get it done so we can realize a tremendous benefit. The BQS stands as an opportunity in the city of New York to be ambitious about the future of the building, the, f the, the future and building of infrastructure that will grow and sustain our economy for the next several decades. Thank you for your time, Council Member. Thank you, Santos, and, and, and for the testimony, the, the, uh, the very strong, passionate testimony. I will say that there has been one thing that has been built that has yet to be integrated, and that's the ferries. So if Gary wants to give a call to the mayor and the governor and see if that can happen, I'd be more um, hopeful that integration could happen. Sounds like a plan. All right, awesome. We'll work on that together. <laughs> Please. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sal Storais. Um I'm a member of the Sheet Metal Workers Local 28, a building trades union here in New York City. I grew up in Gravesend, Brooklyn, which some kids sit at the south side of Brooklyn. <laughs> As a child, I would hear my mom speak about growing up in Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn. She talked about first place and how much fun it was playing t hopscotch and other games with her friends while her parents would sit on the stoop with the neighbors and hang out till the wee hours in the morning. I always wondered why she only told stories about her block as a young child. So later on in life, I asked her why. She told me that she had to move out of the area at a young age because of her dad and work. My grandfather was a police lieutenant and he worked at one police plaza in Lower Manhattan. He moved his family out of Carroll Gardens because of his commute to work. It took him two hours to get to Manhattan and he felt he was taking too much time away from his family. So they moved to Bensonhurst where the commute was easier. Because of his love for the area, my grandfather used some of the money from the sale of his house to buy a property in Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn, to keep a piece of the area with his family. After his passing and the passing of my mom, this property has now been handed down to the grandchildren, me being one of them, there's 38 of them. 424 Clinton Street has a special place in my heart now. With this Brooklyn Queens connector, we have the opportunity of giving the tenants of my property and other people living in Carroll Gardens, Red Hook, and other areas along this corridor a chance to stay and raise their children in such a beautiful place. We give them the opportunity to spend more time with their children instead of their commute. These people will have something my mom and her parents didn't, precious time. This streetcar is a huge project for our city. With an inclusive, collaborative approach, we can anticipate the creation of 16,000 temporary construction jobs. Our city has committed to building and operating the BQX with union labor, which is very important for us middle-class families. The BQX would help accelerate both commercial and residential growth 
It will spur more growth along lengths of the corridor and will create tens of thousands of jobs in construction alone. I wholeheartedly support this project. It will bring good paying union jobs. It will give families extra time to be with each other. It will keep many families living in these beautiful areas and it would definitely make my mom and her parents smile. Please build the BQX. I have one other thing uh, to say. Uh, 16 years ago, my wife got pregnant. Her company moved from Manhattan to Jersey City. Uh, we decided to make the move out of Brooklyn, which was very tough because I grew up in Brooklyn. So I live in Hoboken, New Jersey now. My wife every day now commutes from Hoboken, New Jersey using the light rail. The light rail is built in a flood zone. Uh, Hoboken, as you know, was flooded very badly during Sandy. Uh, you don't have to look very far to do a study and figure out how a light rail system works. You just really need to look across the river. It's efficient, it's very safe, and I, honest to God, have been there 16 years, I don't see many problems with the light rail at all. Uh, as far as how much the cost for repairs and maintenance and everything, I don't know that. That's something that you guys should really look into, do a study on what it costs. It's very efficient and it runs from Bayonne all the way up through Fort Lee, New Jersey, and it's right on the water. Same thing, okay? Thank you. Thank you for that, by the way. And Sal, we'll ha maybe we could do a field trip <laughs> and go, and go ride it together. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Beth Chevry, and I work for the New York State Labor's Lesset Labor Management Cooperation and Trust Fund. We represent over 40,000 union members employed by our signatory contractors in the construction industry in New York City and throughout the state. Our aging transit system does not adequately serve all city residents. The BQX is a solution that will connect underserved neighborhoods from Astoria to Red Hook, where many residents live, including many of our own members, who do not have acceptable access to public transportation. The BQX has the ability to efficiently move a projected 50,000 daily riders along a single corridor that is integrated into the existing transit system and will ease traffic congestion. The streetcars will travel primarily in dedicated lanes separated from vehicle traffic and bikes along the route. It is anticipated that the BQX will result in 16,000 jobs to building trades members, which will strengthen the middle class while providing the city with safe, quality construction. There is no dispute that the current transportation system is inadequate. Moreover, the population along the BQX route is forecast to increase by 30% by 2045. Therefore, the BQX will provide desperately needed transportation now and for decades to come. That's one of the many reasons why we are in support of this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you all for your time. And, and I think the, the theme of this panel is jobs, jobs, and, and jobs, jobs uh, which is important. And I, hear, and I hear that. And I think that that's going to be a balance of all the other pieces. And I'm just thankful that you're here representing uh, the men and women every day that work for, for the city. Uh, I will ask one question. And you can just, maybe your faces will tell me the answer to this question. But I think Carlos Chasura uh, from the New York Building Congress really is calling on and imploring on the council to return to a spirit of aspirational planning. and. And this is a question for, for him and for everybody. Would you support the concept? I mean, the most aspirational thing that we can do is to essentially remove free parking on our streets. That's, that changes everyone's concept of being able to park your personal belonging on a street for free. That overnight will make us think different and change the way that we use transportation, including cars that are a problem right now in the city. And it sounds like that is the most aspirational thing that I've heard so far. Uh, and would you all support that concept? The, the Building and Construction State Council of Greater New York supports building. Yeah. So if that's going to assist us in building and continuously build with labor, putting our members to work, you know, sometimes that, that's parking, parking goes away with this. When we're building, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 story buildings, there are not parkings around these buildings in the city. There's not enough parking uh, along any corridor. Free when parking. You, free parking, when, when, you, when you think of that, right. right? So, I mean. And I hear that. Th and I hear there, that. There's a lot to that. And, and I just want to be able to balance this concept of aspirational. And there's some really aspirational things. And it'd be great to get support from sectors that might not be traditionally connected to transportation. And it sounds like you're here for the BQX for that reason, for the jobs. 
but when, you're en when you enter conversations around transportation, we have to start thinking about that. And so, so um, Councilman, I think you need to come to Hoboken, New Jersey. Yeah, and we're, I really we'll, do. We'll do. With uh, the parking we'll issue, is the same issue with transportation always. And they've come up with some great ideas as far as parking garages and, and other entities that have worked to, to bring parking to it. So maybe part of the development is putting parking garages in these areas to help out people with parking. Just throwing it out there. I like that. I like that. Well, aspirational is what we have, uh, and or I should say, there's not enough. There's enough aspiration right now from the council, and we're going to keep going that direction. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next panel uh, from the Astoria Houses Resi Residents Association, Claudia Koger. Koger. Hard G. Come on up. Thank you. Ingersoll Houses, Daryl Burgess. Urban, Urban Upbound, Bishop Mitchell Taylor. And then uh, from East Helm Elmhurst, Mr. Tom Greck. Queen, uh, the Queen's Chamber maybe? Are you here? And then, uh, can we get the Waterfront Alliance up here, a uh, representative from the Waterfront Alliance, and then uh, the, end, uh, the League of Conservation Voters, Adriana Espinosa, if you're here. Is, is Roland here still? No. And then the RPA, the Regional Planning Association, Malin Meta. Okay. Okay, great. He, okay, great. I think that's good for this panel. We want to see if we can get full full panels as we move forward. Okay. Ms. Koger, you can begin. Make sure that the light is pressed and and on. Sure. And it's close to you. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, hello and thank you, um, thank you, members of the City Council, for allowing me to testify today before you. My name is Claudia Koger. I'm the Astoria Resident Association President for Astoria Houses, uh, residents of approximately uh, over 3,000 uh, residents. And I'm here uh, in support of um, the BQX. Uh, I've lived in uh, Astoria Houses for uh, approximately 64 years uh, as an adult, and, um, but um, I also have worked, I worked for the New York City Transit Authority for 25 years, so I'm talking from two points of the era. Uh, I've, um, I know what it is to travel around the city from Astoria which Astoria has been uh, neglected as far as uh, Astoria Houses has been neglected. Northworth and Queens, more or less, but Astoria Houses has been neglected as far as transportation, having transportation. We are actually uh, situated uh, 30 blocks away from the nearest subway, and um, that's been our, our, our life there. And I'm here to testify in support of the BQX because I and many of the residents I represent need better transportation options. The Astoria Houses are the definition of a transit desert. Sitting on the far side of Astoria, 15 blocks from the closest, 50, I said 30 really, from the closest um, subway station. For residents who are seniors like myself, if you don't have a car, forget about it. Traveling anywhere in the city is a major hassle. We could really benefit from the BQX as more jobs and opportunities come to Queens and the Brooklyn waterfront. Historically, NYCHA developments like mine have been set off from these opportunities effectively, exist effectively existing on an island removed from everything else happening in the city. 
This is true with other developments up and down this corridor. WQX is a perfect chance to right the wrongs of the past and bring a new long-term transit solution to communities in need. My residents and I encourage the council to get behind this important project so we can have an easier time getting to work, to school, to doctor's appointments and other municipal faculties, and to just anywhere. Everyone knows that in New York, time is money, and time it takes for us to get anywhere is a major drain on our wallets. While we've been pleased with the new ferry service, we need transportation that runs more frequent and with more stops in growing job centers. And everybody cannot ride the ferry because a lot of people have motion sicknesses and things like that. So we, we can't call that just the way that we will travel from the peninsula. We want to say clearly that you, that you hear us. We support the BQX and we hope you will too. We are thankful to the Mayor, Mayor de Blasio for putting transportation first for communities in need. And we believe this is an investment in communities that historically have not seen the same level of investments as those in Manhattan. And thank you for hearing us. Good afternoon, members of council. And thank you for listening to my testimony today. My name is Darrell Burgess, and I'm the president of the Ingersoll Houses Resident Association. I'm here to testify in support of the BQX, and I urge you to support it as well. For those who are unfamiliar with the Ingersoll Houses, we're located in an area poorly served by transit, tucked away between Dumbo, downtown Brooklyn, and Fort Greene, near the Brooklyn Navy Yard. <clears throat> Excuse me. For my residents, the BQX would be a lifeline, establishing new connections to opportunities beyond immediate surroundings. NYCHA is talked about so much in the news these days, but you really hear from residents about the conditions and needs. I am here today standing with my fellow residents and resident leaders to say clearly, we need the BQX. It is a solution to one of our historic challenges at the Ingersoll Houses, being out of, being cut out from transit, even as the Brooklyn Queens Expressway dissects our neighborhood. The poor planning has led to a stagnant and disconnected area that the BQX would help to rectify, injecting new life into our community. Our residents are eager to travel in ways that are modern, accessible, and can take us to areas surging with opportunity. The city should capitalize on the job growth the waterfront is experiencing by delivering the transit that makes it sustainable and equitable. The city must make sure that opportunities are afforded to communities historically removed from the job growth of Manhattan, and the BQX is one of the best ways to do that. For my residents, the BQX would shave time off of difficult commutes, establishing a five-minute ride to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, a 15-minute ride to Williamsburg, and a half-hour ride to Long Island City. Right now, getting to some of these areas can take over an hour when traveling by public transit. The long walks to DeKalb Avenue, J Street, and York Street subway stations can be especially hard for seniors, especially when they're in mobile cars and in walkers, and there's elevators at those stations that aren't always working. If you ask about the bus, let me tell you that if I had to take the bus here today, I might still be waiting for it. But um, unlike, uh, it will be quick and easy to board the BQX and we will have fewer stops. As you continue to discuss the needs of NYCHA residents, as you continue to examine the transit crisis our city is facing, as you continue to think about how to make job growth equitable to underserved communities, I hope you will see the true value the BQX can provide in all three areas. This is an important moment to work with us, work with us beyond just thinking about our buildings, work with us in collaboration. Instead of just thinking you have the answers, work with us to help lift our residents up and fulfill the promise of a better life our city provides. We're ready to work with you, and I thank you. 
Good afternoon. Um, I'm Adriana Espinosa, and I'm the director of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Uh, we represent over 30,000 members in New York City, and we're committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. Thank you, Chairman Chaka, for holding this important hearing today. Um, NYLCV supports expanding New York City's transportation network to increase mobility and create a more sustainable transportation system, especially where that Expansion can reduce reliance on cars, improve air quality, and connect New Yorkers living in transit desert to the places they need to go. We embrace new multimodal strategies that bolster the public transportation system, including support for bike share programs, bike infrastructure, light rails, and ferries. The BQX represents one such opportunity to expand access, enabling New Yorkers to travel between Brooklyn and Queens more efficiently. Manhattan is no longer the center of gravity in New York City, and new transportation solutions should reflect modern travel patterns and, ec and growing economic hubs of the outer boroughs. The damage to our subways by Superstorm Sandy and the prohibitively high cr cost of underground expansion make focusing on new options above ground a smart investment. The BQX has potential to connect New Yorkers living in the Brooklyn and Queen waterfront to transportation hubs all over the city, but only if integrated into the city's existing transportation network. Light rail projects are also an opportunity to reprioritize street space to get people around more efficiently and thus could be considered as part of Speaker Johnson's um, transportation master plan. However, in order to be an effective transportation option, they must be given the right of way to operate without getting stuck in traffic or they'll be subject to the same inefficiencies in our, as our buses. Transit signal priority and dedicated lanes are already emerging as ways to increase bus reliability and similar strategies should be implemented as part of the BQX. Ultimately, New York City needs to invest in innovative transportation options that make the best use of our resources to provide the greatest benefit to our people and our environment. Expanding transportation options to meet the needs of more people, especially those not adequ adequately served by the existing system, is key to building a stronger and more sustainable city. Especially in light of congestion pricing, it is incumbent upon all of us to think about how we can better serve people in New York's most populous, uh, two most populous boroughs. To conclude, there are still many questions about this project that need to be answered deliberately, deliberately and thoughtfully, and I will add transparently as well such as whether fares will integrate with the MTA, who will pay for it, and the effects on the existing community that the project will run through. Nonetheless, this project does have potential to be part of a better transit future for New York City. Uh, I'd like to thank the BQS ta Task Force for holding this important oversight hearing. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Menchaca, and thanks for holding this, uh, this hearing to discuss the BQX project. My name is Mola Mehta, and I'm a senior associate at Regional Plan Association. New York City is experiencing a transportation crisis. Fixing it will require new resources, better planning, and the right balance of transit solutions. Our crisis is a result of an aging system that needs investment, congest congested city streets, and a Manhattan-centric transit network that doesn't take people where they want to go. Our aging infrastructure, ongoing delays, and increasing capital costs continue to strain our transit system while 40% of New Yorkers cannot walk to a subway station and limited ADA accessibility limits access even further. This has caused an increase in private and for hire vehicles clogging our streets and polluting our air. These factors have caused us to have some of the slowest bus speeds in the country, and between 2012 and 2017, average weekday bus ridership has declined by 250,000 system-wide. Over 50% of New York City job growth over the last 15 years has been in the outer boroughs, yet improvements in outer borough transit have not kept pace. Right now, too many New Yorkers have to take circuitous routes from one borough to the next unless they have access to a car. Commute times for inner borough travel outside of Manhattan can be over, over an hour long. Congestion pricing will help provide funding and reduce congestion in Midtown, but it doesn't help connect the fastest growing boroughs. A project like the BQX is needed to connect areas of Brooklyn and Queens, spur job growth, and cont contribute to a more robust transit system that can accommodate a growing city, particularly in the outer boroughs. These neighborhoods also deserve a comprehensive set of investments, such as implementation of RPA's proposed Triborough Line, which is a passenger rail line on existing tracks between Brooklyn and the Bronx, more robust and reliable bus routes, discounted fares on LIR trips, implementation of Metro North access to Penn Station, and enhanced bike share. BQX is a vital part of a much needed outer borough transit strategy. Many of these investments will call for in our fourth regional plan. We look forward to seeing what the EIS impact analysis shows and working to best meet community transit needs with an expanded 
and connected network for all New Yorkers. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple questions before before I leave, let this panel go, and I'll start with the the resident associations. And if either of you can talk a little bit about when you first heard about the BQX and how did you hear about it? I um, I met the um, BQX uh, in uh, 2015, I believe it was. Um, when they f were first uh, getting organized, they came to Astoria uh, at our Boys and Girls Club, and we gathered there as um, just to be introduced to them. At that time, they called the, uh, the association presidents along with Urban Upbound and, and the other um, mm. constituents just to introduce it to us. And um, from that time, our we had con made contacts with them, and they, um, are, they organized the uh, Friends of the BQX there, from there, and I was a f became a friend of the BQX from day one. Are either of you, oh, I, actually, mm -hmm. yes. I too was introduced to the Friends of BQX in 2015. At the current time, I was the vice president of the resident association, mm -hmm. and, um, it was a wonderful opportunity because we knew Wegmans was coming to the Brooklyn Navy Yard and there was an opportunity for residents in her development to come down to our development mm. without the underground of the train and traveling along the waterfront with the BQX to come to the Brooklyn Navy Yard and visit Wegmans as well. Got it, got it. Mm -hmm. and, and so essentially it wasn't the city. Uh, have, have you been interacting with the city itself? either DOT or the EDC, the city officials on the BQX? Have they reached out? Have they connected with you on any, for any reason? I have a, a, a continued uh, connection with uh, EDC and um, uh, all of their information, uh, whatever they're involved with, they are constantly uh, email. I'm on their email list and those are the things. So I do have a, a a connection to Good. discuss with them. Good. I want to make sure that that's strong. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we do as well. We're also Good. connected. Okay, great. Because yeah. these are two different organizations. Yes. One's uh, government and the other one's nonprofit, kind of private. Yeah. So I want to make sure that, that you have good connections. As, as uh, Adriana spoke to, transparency is going to be important. So I want to make sure that you're there uh, and connected to both. Absolutely. And, uh, and then for Actually, I, no, I think you were both very clear on, on items. So thank you so much for your testimony. We're thank gonna go you. to the next panel now. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, from Tech NYC, Brian Lozano, are you here? Yes? And then Pratt Center for Community Development, Paula Crespo, if you're here. Dumbo Bid, uh, Alexandria Sika, please. And then Ron, uh, Ron Zach from the Fifth Avenue Committee. If you're here, Okay, who would like to begin? Let's begin with you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Chaka. Uh, thank you for creating this opportunity to publicly examine the BQX project. Um, I'm Paula Crespo. I'm a senior planner at the Pratt Center for Community Development. And as an organization working to address socioeconomic inequity in New York City, we place special focus on the ways that public actions can either exacerbate or alleviate that inequity. In the past year, we've launched the Public Value, Public Value Recovery Policy Project to examine whether and how value capture tools can be used to advance social justice and how to distinguish when these tools instead exacerbate inequality. To do that, we have identified criteria for an equity framework. And today I'm going to apply some of these criteria in question format to the BQX project. So criterion one, 
From whom will the public sector recover the economic value created as a result of the BQX? Those who own land near the proposed route will see their property values rise as a result of this amenity and in turn will pay higher property taxes that will indirectly finance the BQX. However, the low-income households and many small businesses near the BQX will either be forced to pay for this increased value in the form of higher rents or they'll be displaced. Two, who will receive the economic value created as a result of the BQX? Landowners near the route will most directly receive the economic value that the BQX may create because living near a new transit mode will create a greater demand for housing. This will put even more upward pressures on rents while exacerbating the displacement pressure on low-income residents and small businesses. This has already been the case with low-income areas near Atlanta's uh, Beltline, which is a 22-mile corridor of trails, bike paths, and eventually transit that is funded by value capture. Three, who bears the financial risks of depending on future tax revenues to fund the BQX up front? EDC's 2016 study presumes that the BQX will spur an increase in property values, but it doesn't quantify how much property values would have risen even if the BQX weren't built. If property values don't rise significantly, significantly more than they would have anyway without the BQX, the city will have to siphon off tax revenues that should have been spent on other things. This means that the general public bears the financial risk for a project that has been falsely touted as self-financing. And finally, who is involved in governing and how does this affect the budgeting and decision-making process? If the council approves the BQX, it will fall under the jurisdiction of a special purpose entity. And you, our elected decision maker, and, and your colleagues will have limited oversight. The revenue generated through value capture will be governed by others, and you will not be able to consider other ways of using it that might create more broad-based transportation benefits or benefits designed to reach people negatively affected by rising housing costs. And I just want to end by mentioning that more information about this equity framework um, and how it applies to Atlanta's Beltline project that I mentioned um, is available in a piece that was published earlier this week in Metropolitics, and my testimony has a link to that. Thank you for that. And, and I think you heard some of the questioning that we had of VDC that teased out some of the questions that you had too. Uh, so let's keep working together to understand that together. Thank you. Great. Uh, my name is Brian Lozano. I'm with Tech NYC. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity to testify today. Tech NYC is a nonprofit association with the mission of supporting the tech industry in New York through increased engagement between our more than 750 member companies, New York government, and the community at large. Tech NYC works every day to foster a dynamic, diverse, and creative ecosystem, ensuring New York is the best place to start and grow a tech company. Today, New York City's tech ecosystem is stronger than ever, and New York has become a global hub of innovation. The New York tech ecosystem now boasts more than 333,000 jobs and 9,000 startups in the tech, and tech has a significant impact on the city's economic well-being. As the industry continues to grow, companies are regularly looking to establish offices beyond Manhattan's central business district and locate throughout the five boroughs. This pattern of growth limits congestion and crowding and helps ensure a greater number of communities benefit from economic growth. However, our public transportation system does not adequately account for current growth trends and has slowed tech companies' efforts to embrace the outer boroughs. Going forward, we must ensure our public transportation system accounts for outer borough development and helps fuel geographically equitable growth. Brooklyn and Queens are two boroughs that have had already seen significant growth. The corridor from Sunset Park to Astoria is already home to more than 500 tech companies and is projected to have 56 million square feet of office space within the next 10 years. Yet there is no efficient public transportation that spans the entirety of the Brooklyn Queens waterfront. Our city must address this lack of transportation by expanding the number of transportation options and the types of options in the corridor. Having multimodal transportation options from trains to buses, from bikes to ferries, will be vital to continued success of the area and the New York City as a whole. The BQX is one of the transportation options in the, the city should pursue, as it would allow New Yorkers to more easily access jobs and help tech companies located in the corridor attract employees. Just as importantly, the BQX will help connect thousands of New Yorkers, including 44,000 NYCHA residents, to workforce development opportunities and growing tech education hubs like places like downtown Brooklyn, which is home to New York Tandon and CUNY Tech. It is clear that the growth of the tech sector is key to our city's future. However, this growth is the 
and the pattern of growth are not predetermined. The city can and should take steps to ensure the sector grows in a diverse and equitable manner. A key step for achieving that goal would be to build a BQX. So I'd like to thank again for the city council for holding this hearing, an important project, and hope that we can commit to creating the BQX in the name of better transit for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for holding this important hearing on this new important public transit option. My name is Ron Zach and I'm Director of Development and Communications at Fifth Avenue Committee. Uh, Fifth Avenue Committee, FAC, is a 41-year-old South Brooklyn-based nonprofit comprehensive community development corporation and NeighborWorks member whose mission is to advance economic and social justice. Um, we develop and manage affordable housing community facilities, we create economic op opportunities and ensure access to economic stability for over 5,500 um, low and moderate income residents each year. Many of the people that FACT serves, the affordable housing that we have built and manage or will be building and the jobs that we place unemployed and underemployed New Yorkers into are along the Brooklyn waterfront. We built uh, Red Hook's single largest development of affordable co-ops called Red Hook Homes. Um, we own and manage affordable housing along the Columbia Street waterfront. Our main office is in Gowanus and um, we're developing further um, projects in Gowanus including Gowanus Green which will bring over 750 units of affordable housing to Gowanus. We provide adult education and literacy um, to a wide range of um, folks from throughout the city, financial coaching and, um, and a range of community development services. Many of our um, participants are NYCHA residents and we have their interests uh, at heart. Our workforce development affiliate runs a NYCHA resident training academy and has offices in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, that connect people to jobs there and train people with barriers to entries to employment. So in, in all of these respects, um, we know the waterfront very well. I'm sorry. Um, so, let's see. We know that many people fear the BQX will only add fuel to the fire of gentrification and displacement that already exist in many communities across the city. Those are legitimate concerns that must be addressed as part of advancing the BQX. But not investing in the BQX in communities that deserve public transit and need that investment is not a solution to gentrification and displacement. The value capture mechanism that is being contemplated to fund a portion of the cost of BQX must be applied surgically to mitigate displacement pressures on low and moderate income families and job generating industrial businesses. For example, the city must institute the Certificate of No Harassment program, which is currently in a pilot phase and only implemented as part of a city sponsored land use actions in advance of the public approval process for BQX to protect tenants against possible harassment and ensure that tenant harassment is severely punished. The BQX literally has the ability to connect tens of thousands of public housing and other residents along the Brooklyn Queens waterfront to opportunity and to improve the quality of life for thousands. The Fifth Avenue Committee believes the BQX is worthy of support and that any negative impacts can and must be mitigated with a range of public policies and programs. So thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Sure. Hello, my name is Calvis Mickelsteins and I'm testifying for Alexandra Sika, who's the executive director of the Dumbo Business Improvement District. As you know, Dumbo is a lovely waterfront neighborhood in Brooklyn. We are also the single densest cluster of tech and creative companies in the city, with thousands of startups, including Etsy, Rent the Runway, and Quip. We are also visited by hundreds of thousands of tourists each month, thanks to gorgeous views, city investments in Brooklyn Bridge Park, and the amazing buzz for Brooklyn that has grown over the past years. A large challenge in Dumbo is transit. The options to reach the neighborhood and the emerging employment clusters in the Brooklyn Tech Triangle are severely limited. The F train is one of the only options, which means many Queens residents must travel through Manhattan to get to Dumbo. Even if you are willing to cross borough lines, the York Street F station is woefully overcrowded, 
with a single entrance that backs up at rush hour so severely that it has been a deterrent for many businesses looking to locate in the neighborhood. We need more transit options and better transit options. The demand for reliable transit will only intensify as new offices continue to open up at the Empire Stores and former Jehovah's Witnesses properties, and 3,000 residential units are set to open up in the next two years. In order to service the needs of our workers, residents, current and future local businesses, the city needs to make inroads in sustainable transit solutions. A BQX connection to Dumbo would allow for more startups and businesses, business hopefuls to expand their reach, eventually culminating in a waterfront-wide network of closely coordinated and robust economic growth. When I ask about challenges to growing a business in Dumbo, our CEOs are always pointing to the limits of existing transit, and they follow up that sentiment by telling me that the majority of their workforce hails from Brooklyn and Queens. We would encourage the city to consider a spur to Dumbo, but even the current route would help our business and employees, especially at the northern end of our neighborhood. A 12-minute walk to the Etsy offices from the BQX is a good start. It would also be meaningful for thousands of our workforce and our neighbors at the Farragut houses as well. We don't want folks driving to Dumbo from Red Hook or Long Island City. We want them hopping on the BQX. It's clear the New York City of the past is very different from the New York City of today, which sees an abundance of economic activity outside of Manhattan. It is incumbent upon the city to support innovative transportation ideas like the BQX, which will deliver the transportation infrastructure needed to help our city thrive in the future. Thank you. We were just looking at the map, and the new map doesn't have, and you, you, you spoke to a uh, spur. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us what that means? Um, well, <clears throat> the idea would be a, a spur is something that kind of just branches off the main line um, that could either connect at two ends or just uh, run into the neighborhood. Um, it's, uh, it's just an idea that, you know, transit directly through Dumbo would be beneficial, um, even more beneficial if it was right through the neighborhood as opposed to being adjacent to it. Got it. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for your testimony. I, I think we want to move through the rest of the, the panels, but I think... Everyone that I that I heard today really spoke to transparency, understanding of information. It's gentrification that's real, job opportunities that's real, and we got to make sure that we understand it all before we, we kind of move forward. And um, okay, and that's what we're dedicated to. So thank you. Next we have from the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, Terry Carta. If you're here. Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, Regina Meyer. And the Brooklyn War Memorial, Toba Potoski. The Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, Samara uh, Karis Karasik. Are you here? You're here, good, awesome, come on up. Oh yeah. We were also joined by Councilmember Mark Jonai earlier today. Okay. Let's start over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for holding this hearing, Councilmember Menchaca. We're happy to be having the conversation. My name is Terry Carta, and I'm the Executive Director of Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, BGI. We're a private nonprofit organization that has been focused for nearly two decades on the development, establishment, and long-term stewardship of the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway, as you're well aware. Um, and the Greenway is, um, for anybody who is not familiar, a landscaped, protected, pedestrian, and cyclist route along the entirety of the Brooklyn Waterfront that provides continuous access to the waterfront connects parks and open space, and adds new mobility options for transit-starved residential and business communities. The vision for BQX complements the vision for the Greenway in that it addresses similar needs and offers some of the same benefits. I'm here today to ask that the task force and city council and city agencies working on this project um, address the proposed alignment and implementation timeline so that BQX does indeed complement and not compete with the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway. BGI has a history of success in community-based visioning and planning 
which in 2012 led to the city's um, creation and publication of an implementation plan for the Greenway that consists of 23 distinct capital projects and six future enhancement projects, as they were called, one of which actually is also proposed as part of the BQX plan, which is a pedestrian and cyclist bridge over Newtown Creek, better connecting Brooklyn and Queens. The Greenway's construction thus far has been realized through significant financial investments from local, city, state, and federal entities to the amount of uh, more than $220 million. Approximately 18 miles of the full 26-mile planned route are currently in use by an estimated 10,000 pedestrians and cyclists users daily, demonstrating public demand for and the immediate benefits afforded by the Greenway. However, the Greenway can't fulfill its full potential until the remaining gaps are filled and the route is fully connected. It's clear that multiple mobility solutions need to be simultaneously sought and coordinated in order to meet the current and future demands of increasing population and population density along the Brooklyn Queens waterfront. No single solution is a panacea, and giving people viable and reliable choices means giving people higher quality of life. Again, BQX complements BGI's vision for the Greenway, and yet the proposed alignment for BQX seems to overlap the Greenway in a few locations, Columbia Street waterfront, Flushing Ave Avenue along the Navy Yard, and a small section of Kent Avenue in Williamsburg to be uh, direct. Um, BGI asks that these locations are coordinated to allow the full realization of the Greenway in concert with BQX. Second, closing major gaps in the Greenway um, which are in Red Hook, Sunset Park, Coney Island, and Dumbo, can and should be done before BQX breaks ground. Completing the Greenway route can be done in five years and is estimated to cost less than 10% of the total uh, BQX proposed budget. BGI also hopes, so third and last, BGI also hopes that coordination of BQX with the Greenway will result in increased connectivity in the short term between Brooklyn and Queens waterfront neighborhoods. Um, and we hope that this includes the design, funding, and construction of a pedestrian and cyclist bridge over Newtown Creek on the front end of BQX implementation as an immediate benefit to these communities. BGI looks forward to continuing to work with the city council and our city agencies to realize this vision. And I thank the task force and city council um, at large for its work on behalf of our city. Thank you. Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Caroline Perry, and I'm here to read a statement on behalf of Regina Meyer, the president of the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. DBP is a not-for-profit local development corporation that manages three different business improvement districts that comprise downtown Brooklyn. The partnership's mission is to advance economic development activities in downtown Brooklyn and help create a world-class business, cultural, educational, residential, and retail destination. As New York City's largest central business district outside of Manhattan, downtown Brooklyn has seen record employment, residential, and industry growth in recent years. However, this growth is impeded by the lack of transit access to the Brooklyn-Queens waterfront. Downtown Brooklyn is served by 13 MTA subway lines and countless bus routes, but getting to Red and to and from Red Hook, Long Island City, Williamsburg, and even the Brooklyn Navy Yard is a challenge, one that we must solve if we are to remain competitive. We know that infrastructure projects uh, can take a good deal of time, political will, and advocacy to get done. That is why we're here today to lend our support for the Brooklyn-Queens connector. The BQX would carry 50,000 passengers a day, a capacity currently unmet by most existing transit modes in the city. It would offer a connection not only for the area's 46,000 and counting residents, but for downtown Brooklyn's 45,000 college students, for whom reliable transportation is especially important. Likewise, as a burgeoning jobs hub in its own right, downtown Brooklyn's companies that need to attract the best talent from across the city in order to thrive are not easily accessible for those living in growing residential areas of Queens and Brooklyn, including the NYCHA developments along the streetcars route. Downtown Brooklyn is one of the many areas poised for remarkable economic growth in the coming decades. The BQX offers a street mode alignment that bridges the transit gaps in Brooklyn and Queens in a way we've never seen before. By connecting the innovation corridor stretching along the East River waterfront from Brooklyn to Queens, we can support businesses, educational, and cultural institutions, attract new investment, and grow our talent pool not only in downtown Brooklyn, but in every neighborhood along the 11-mile route. 
With an increasing abundance of economic activity focused outside Manhattan, it's clear that we need to embrace a new vision for transportation and that this is the place to start. It is incumbent upon the city to support innovative transportation ideas like the BQX and deliver the transportation infrastructure needed to help our city thrive in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Chaka and members of the BQX Task Force. I'm Samara Karasik, Chief Policy Officer at the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber is the voice of Brooklyn's business community, offering the resources, programs, tools, and direct support services needed to continue creating jobs and opportunities in their communities. We are here today to express our support for the BQX. We endorse this project because the Brooklyn Chamber works to develop and sustain a healthy and robust business environment, which requires an extensive and efficient transportation infrastructure. Our work catalyzes community, workforce, and economic development. We are witnessing a surge in business growth along the Brooklyn waterfront, so much so that we have named this area the Brooklyn Innovation Coast because of the large influx of technology, new manufacturing, and creative companies. These companies are drawn to the region because of the vibrancy of the landscape, diversity of culture, and strong talent pool. But our current transit infrastructure is inadequate for the economy and jobs to continue to grow at this pace. Our transit infrastructure was built to move people into Manhattan's central business district, not to move them around Brooklyn and the outer boroughs. This transportation deficiency prevents workers in Brooklyn's transit deserts from commuting to good paying jobs along the coast all the way up to Queens and into other parts of Brooklyn. We are staunch proponents of supporting the growing job sectors that will benefit all our residents. Transportation must be improved for more equitable growth to occur. For this reason, we strongly endorse various forms of new transit, from ferries to bus rapid transit and expanded subway service to the BQX. We need more and better transit to achieve the waterfront's full potential and give Brooklyn residents equal access to jobs of all levels in manufacturing, creative industries, and technology. The BQX would help underserved commuters in Brooklyn and Queens. It would serve as a model for developing new and reliable transit in other parts of our city to grow job opportunities for all. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Good afternoon. Chairman Menchaca and task force members, thank you for the opportunity for speaking to you today. I should say um, that I am a member of the Friends of the BQX uh, board. And so like many of us here, we all sit on many, many boards. And so when I wrote down the card, I just wrote down the Brooklyn War Memorial, which is a great organization that everybody should learn about. We're restoring really New York City's only World War II memorial. And it's located in downtown Brooklyn, which once the BQX is available, more and more people would be able to visit once we get it reopened. OK, that's not why I came here today. All right. Um, more than 20 years ago, members of the New York City Council approved funds to create bike lanes in New York City. That decision took vision and understanding that New Yorkers were looking for alternatives to buses and subways. It also took courage, because allocating taxpayer funds for something as simple and old-fashioned as bike lanes were certain to be criticized by those who lacked the same vision and understanding. Certainly the loudest people in the room would say it would be a waste of money, which they did, and nobody rides bicycles anymore, and that's what they were saying. So fast forward 20 years, and according to NYC.org, in 2017, New Yorkers averaged 490,000 bike rides per day. Of these rides, 20% were commuter trips. So those councilmen 20 years ago were right, and now New York has over 1,200 miles of bike lanes. So here we are again, talking about a simple and old-fashioned idea, streetcars, the BQX. It would be stranger to have this conversation if, st if streetcars weren't so successful everywhere else. They're successful around the world and much closer to home, as we heard now in New Jersey. Um, I just wanted to point out two examples that I looked up online. The, the Buffalo Metro uh, light rail runs 6.4 miles, and it averages 16,900 riders per day. And then even closer is uh, the Hudson Bergen light rail runs 17 miles and it averages 54,434 riders per day. The BQX represents jobs and opportunities where they don't exist now. It's cleaner than cars, as we all know, and more efficient and more versatile than our current bus service. Uh, I just need another, uh, just half a second. Uh, this is really, really important. It's stroller and wheelchair accessible, no steps, and that's so vital for our senior community that is um, focused on keeping their independence as they age. 
I don't know how many people here are, um, here are from downtown Brooklyn, but I can't wait for the BQX so I can go to the Brooklyn Navy Yard and shop at Wegmans, which we've been waiting for a long time for. Um, you know, I, I know this is not in the immediate plan, but I would love to be able to take it to Prospect Park or even Industry Park. So I hope that that is something that is revisited um, going down to Sunset Park. I just want to leave you with this thought. So Brooklyn's population, no secret, is booming and will continue to boom. The MTA is not adding new buses or subway lines, and so we're here asking for you to have the same vision and understanding that council members had when considering this crazy idea of bike lanes. So once again, I just want to reiterate, please support the BQX. Its time has come. Thank you. Thank you uh, to this panel. And uh, again, I think this, these are important things to, to talk about and important to hear, and I hope you felt heard today. And there are two things I just want to point out, because we keep on hearing the same um, uh, talking point about the 50,000 uh, ridership for BQX. And I know that in some ways we're going to get a little bit more details with the EIS from EDC, which I think we're all looking for. And, and I keep on lo looking up at this screen, and and there's a sense of, 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 of discrepancy here on just one of the routes in the city uh, which which is the weekly kind of ridership and so we're trying to figure out how we can get the ridership right in terms of how the BQX is kind of structured on their weekly numbers versus the the bus systems that we have right now and I think that's going to be important to do so I want to go back and maybe ask uh, Miss Meyer where she got those numbers and we can come back and talk a little, little bit later because she used them in the testimony and I want to kind of get a sense maybe she she has a transportation planner that she's working with I want to, we want to talk to them, uh, but it seems like it's the same number, so I want to know if it's the same person or, or whatnot, but I think those are important things to talk about. And then for the chamber, um, you heard from the Atlantic Avenue bid. Are you hearing from businesses on both sides? Are both sides kind of talking to the chamber right now about business issues along corridors that are going to be directly impacted, and what are some of those voices uh, saying to the chamber, that are members potentially of the chamber? I mean, we hear from our businesses that it's really hard to find good employees in many different ways. Um, and we hear on the workforce development side that you know it can be tough for people to get to jobs in Brooklyn. So you know, we're pro-jobs. So, so it's kind of a transportation question, right? It's a general transportation question. We came out with a comprehensive economic development strategy um, last year. And in that, one of the major points that we put in there is for us to continue to grow our economy and grow jobs, we really need to have better transportation. And the BQX was one of the transportation projects that we cited as, as helping with that. And, but what about the businesses that are along the corridor that are gonna be impacted as we heard from the Atlantic Gavin? And I think you were here when you heard them mm -hmm. speak to that. Have you been hearing from those businesses that will essentially, like EDC mentioned, uh, Sunset Park, and one of the many reasons they removed the sense of park included business interruption are you hearing from businesses that are going to be interrupted throughout the course of the of the utility changes and the construction of the rail i have not um at you this haven't point. okay mm -hmm. um i have and so i want to make sure that you connect with them and their chamber uh their chamber members and so i want to make sure that okay. you listen to your constituency in a way that that I can connect you to them so that you can talk That'd to them as well. That'd be great. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Next panel. We have uh, Southwest Brooklyn Tenant Union. Uh, Balan Ms. Balanda Joachim. Did I get that right? Uh, the Brooklyn, New York Nandini Fukon Architects. Streets Pack, Eric, come on up. I say I see you here. The Merchants on Atlantic Avenue is Matthew uh, Lasorga here. Okay. So we have Eric, and not a lot of people in the room. So I want to make sure that I, if we if we just have to say next, uh, David Rosen, are you here? He left. He left? Okay. Uh, Bruce Silverglade from Gleason's Gym in Dumbo. George Heikesel. 
Yes. Come on up. Thank you. Uh, G1 Quantum, Greg Waltman. Come on up. That's three of you. Let's get a fourth number. We'll get the fourth. Mr. Um, Shabazz Stewart, who is representing Mr. Tucker Reed. Send our best. Oh, is that four? Okay, that's four. Great. Greg Walton. I just lost my mouse because someone was confused. Oh, no, no, you're good. You're good. Yeah, right here. Right here. Yeah. You started it. You're back. Oh, yeah. What do you mean you started it? You're having That's good. If we can start with you, please. Thank you. All right. <laughs> High tech. My name is George Hykalis, and I'm the president of the Institute for Rational Urban Mobility. IRM is a New York City-based nonprofit concerned with reducing motor vehicle congestion and improving the livability of dense urban places. IRM has long supported light rail as an important element of a comprehensive transportation and land use plan for New York City. Light rail provides an attractive alternative to rubber-tired transport modes. It provides a smooth, self-enforcing path and a permanence that reinforces new development. Some 70 years ago, the city hosted a five-borough light rail streetcar tram network that was the envy of the world. As important as subway and elevated railways were, it was the surface street railways that fostered much of the city's early development and filled in the gaps between stations on the rapid transit network. Unfortunately, Robert Moses, the city's master builder, had a different vision for the city that emphasized the automobiles. While New York City could, be, could have accommodated both, Moses, both modes, Moses had an almost messianic view that streetcars had to be removed from traffic to move, for traffic to move freely. This vision, as we know, failed because a city as dense and crowded as New York could not accommodate a totally auto-centric surface transportation network. The result has been chaotic. Uh, Iram commends the mayor for advancing the Brooklyn-Queens waterfront light rail line as a sensible first stage in bringing this mode back to the city. Just across the Hudson River, as we heard earlier today, New Jersey has built a similar waterfront light rail line, which is quite popular and has served as an important instrument for economic development. Iram urges the city council to make a junket across the river to see how much of the world is moving toward more sustainable urban rail transit. Thank you. And I think there's a couple of invites to cross the river for that, so <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna do that. We're going to do that. that. <laughs> thank you. I'd like to thank the committee for uh, allowing me to speak. My name is Shabazz Stewart. I'm reading a statement on behalf. Sure. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, my name is Shabazz Stewart. I am here to read a statement on behalf of Tucker Reed. Uh, hi, my name is Tucker Reed. I am the co-founder and principal of Totem. At Totem, our work draws upon the expertise of our team in urban revitalization to promote a vibrant local economy. We've all seen downtown Brooklyn and Brooklyn as a whole blossom into a world-class destination for culture, the arts, and economic opportunity. In Brooklyn, there are lessons and models that we can export to the rest of the city, in turn ensuring the collective prosperity of our five boroughs. The question of implementing a streetcar line between Brooklyn and Queens has been floating around for quite some time now, but a lot of crucial points tend to get eclipsed by the narrow analysis of the proposal. We need to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. We're seeing a new spine of New York along the Brooklyn Queens waterfront, and the, and the one limiting its potential is the lack of transit. 
Although the BQX will be a boon to, co to, co to, excuse me, to commuters in our most underserved neighborhoods, it's by and large an economic development, um, an eco a tool for economic development and growth. One can look to the construction of the East River bridges in the 19th and 20th centuries and see the opportunities that were unlocked for millions of New Yorkers through the East-West connections, which helped cement the economic ties between the city's population centers. Or our North-South connection has not yet been made, and the BQX would be a comprehensive transit solution required to lay the foundation for job growth, more affordable housing, and office space. We are seeing unprecedented employment and residential growth in Brooklyn and Queens, which paves the way for a labor force and creative talent pool that should no longer have to rely on traveling through Manhattan to reach their destinations. The Brooklyn Tech Triangle and Long Island City are driving a lot of this growth, and it's imperative that we make them accessible to our public housing residents living along the proposed route. We cannot allow this corridor to be left just to market forces alone. The waterfront would be otherwise dominated exclusively by luxury housing, and our streetscape would be fraught with cars, taxis, Ubers, and private shuttles. Without the BQX, the Brooklyn Queens waterfront will be haunted by missed opportunities for job growth and equity for our most neglect no, excuse me, and equity for our most neglected neighborhoods. This is a huge project that can lay the groundwork and foundation for growth for generations to come, and a promise and economic return that would allow the great city of New York to become even greater. Thank you uh, for reading the statement. I think this is the strongest argument for what I what I um, what we've been kind of hearing today, which is this is an economic development project, and it's pretty clear. Uh, maybe he can join us in the no free parking in New York City <laughs> uh, coalition. Send him that request, and I'll talk to him later about it. Eric. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, my name is Eric McClure. I am the executive director of Streets PAC, a political action committee that advocates for safer streets and better public transit uh, in New York City. And uh, you can count me as a member of the No Free Parking Coalition as well. Um, in general, enhancements to public transportation are things that we should embrace as a city. New transit lines that enhance connectivity and provide service to areas that have been underserved by existing systems have the potential to greatly improve people's lives. I'd like to sit here today and welcome the proposed BQX with open arms, but there are a number of reasons for concern. The cost of building the BQX will be significant, and it's easy to argue that parallel bus service, which would offer potentially equal or superior transit service, could be implemented far more cheaply and far more quickly as well. Most new streetcar projects built across the country during the past decade, however, have been constructed primarily to enhance economic development rather than as robust additions to local transit networks. The costs tend to be borne widely, while the benefits accrue much more narrowly. It's also easy to argue that investments in transit would have much greater return if directed toward improving the city's struggling bus network. Building protected bus lanes, speeding up the implementation of signal priority and off-board all-door boarding and the like. Most importantly, there are two essential features critical to the BQX's success, and without iron ironclad commitments to those features, the project should not proceed. The first is fair integration with the existing New York City transit system. If the BQX is to serve as a pathway to economic opportunity for those neighborhoods along the planned route, it must offer seamless and free transfers to and from intersecting subway and bus lines. Requiring people to pay a second fare to connect to other transit options will create a barrier that those most in need won't be able to afford and will render the BQX a streetcar line serving mostly affluent riders. The second key element required for the BQX to succeed is a 100% dedicated right of way along the entirety of the route. Where streetcars have failed, it has been principally due to incursion by drivers into the paths of streetcars. We all know far too well New York drivers' propensity to double park with impunity, and to think that somehow that won't happen along a streetcar route is pure folly. Right of way cannot be enforced. It must be created and maintained structurally. And without completely dedicated right of way, the BQX will be doomed to failure. We urge a task force to mandate fair integration and exclusive right of way if the BQX project is to move forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council and Chairman Chaka. I am Greg Waltman. I have a clean energy company, G1 Quantum. Um, we spoke a couple months ago about uh, Quantum Tracks, which is a variation of speed breaker technology, speed breaker technology being cars going over um, 
speed breakers, which then in turn create kinetic energy, which can be redirected back into the energy grid. Now, if we take a solution like that and reapply it to subways at the type of tremendous amount of load that goes through subways, you're well on your way to creating the first ever self-sustainable city in the world, which is, you know, nothing to, to shy away from. When considering different types of budgetary concerns of BQX and profitability and uh, making sure the budget within the city council's limits is, you know, being addressed the way that it can be. Um, moving from there, you know, a, as I uh, remind the council about the quantum tracks initiatives and this initiative as it falls um, or is parsed by the Green New Deal initiative of um, different types of constituents through New York, you, you know, putting it all together, you know, when, when we're talking about allocating resources, budgetary concerns, and I'm telling you that there's a solution, Quantum Tracks, that has the ability to not only resolve all these uh, indifferences or concerns, but create the first ever self-sustainable city in the world, it should be something that should be, you know, kind of celebrated, I, I would think, that we are on our way to, to that type of solution. But instead, we have, you know, not to speak too negatively, but Mayor de Blasio now running for president, announcing his presidency at Trump Tower under the guise of 76 or so protesters of a Green New Deal initiative, and again, we're not parsing through the value hyper-protectionist narratives within the mainstream media, presenting the public an illusion of choice when these solutions exist. Does that does that make sense? It you know it, it, it's almost like well, you know the one, the one side of the argument is saying well, how much does it cost? It's too expensive. It's too. Expensive. I've already said that it paid for itself. So as we go on and on and on, and we, we see these types of budgetary considerations, 18 million, 10 million, et cetera, like that, and, and as we move our way up along these initiatives, I'm not advocating for a big dig Boston type of style uh, track enhancement, but as track enhancements go along, these can, quantum tracks can be implemented and then retroactively activated and then added back to the current existing energy grid to resolve these types of budgetary um, discrepancies in the long run indefinitely if we're able to move beyond the value hyper-protectionism within the uh, existing type of um, argument or uh, discussion around these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And and again, I, I think we're always we're always wanting to look at, at new ideas and how to think about this. Both the concerns that were brought up in this panel uh, that are not unique to this panel, but consistent in the panel about fair integration and how how that works. Will that work? Federal funding. When does that come in? And do we have to have all these things in place before we move forward? Uh, or a whole other other concept and technology that might be coming in. And so we're, if you want to give us more information, we'd, we'd be happy to take that as well. And, and this is why we're doing this public hearing, is to really get a sense about what these, these uh, blind spots are at this point, and then remove those blind spots, understand it, and see if we can make a decision together. Exactly. District by district by district, and this is a long set of districts. Uh, okay, thank you all for your for your attention to this, and we look forward to working with you. This is not over, and we want to make sure that we keep <laughs> engaging you. Okay, uh, is uh, Abney here? Christopher uh, Speraza. <clears throat> Pursuit. David Yang, come on up. He's there. Zachary Weiner from Bargo Nutrition. Nutrient, Bargno, no, not here. Don Skeet from Jamit Bistro. What's the last name? Sophia uh, Guitar Casa Rubio Claudia Gonzalez, are you here? Matt Emmy, Friends of BQX, are you here? And then Nick DeFonte, uh, representing Nick DeFonte, Jessica Ford, come on up. 
Is there anybody else that wanted to testify that has not testified that wants to testify? That's it. We're at the end. Wonderful. Let's start over here. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Yang, and I'm a co-founder of Pursuit. Pursuit is a nonprofit that creates transformation where it's needed most. Through our four-year intensive software development training program, we train adults with the most need and potential to get jobs in technology, advance in their careers, and become the next generation of leaders in technology. Our graduates are hired by leading companies like Pinterest, Kickstarter, LinkedIn, BlackRock, and JP Morgan. Our graduates, on average, come in making $18,000 a year, and they graduate uh, and get jobs making over $85,000 a year. The tech industry is at the forefront of much of the progress in New York City. The success of many industries is contingent on the growth of the tech sector. The rate of innovation within tech demands reliable and equitable education, and we at Pursuit seek to equip adults with the expertise required to carve out their place in the increasingly competitive job market. The public transit routes to and from our office in Long Island City, however, are limited and further constrained by worsening bus and train performance and congestion. As our city grows, hundreds and, th hundreds and thousands of New Yorkers in need of equitable transit are effectively being left behind. About half of Pursuit's graduates are black or Latino, half are women, and almost two-thirds do not have a college degree. Over 60% of our participants receive public assistance. We need the BQX to continue empowering these students to achieve their dreams because they have not been adequately served by existing resources. The BQX bridges the gap between our most marginalized neighborhoods and the educational hubs that are designed to cater to their needs. There is also a substantial number of blue collar workers that could benefit from retraining and workforce development programs that currently do not have a convenient outlet to refine existing skills as well as learn new ones. The BQX would not only help students during their time at Pursuit, but after they graduate and are ready to enter the workforce. With a number of tech companies ready to embrace the waterfront both in Queens and Brooklyn, the streetcar would connect students to the job opportunities they have, that they have worked so hard to prepare for. An investment in the BQX would be an investment in the health of our tech economy. We implore the council to consider the longevity of this project and the fundamental promise of opportunity that it guarantees for New Yorkers in need. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dawn Skeet, and I own a small restaurant called Jamet Bistro in Red Hook, Brooklyn. We opened just earlier this year, but I have been running a catering company throughout Brooklyn for 14 years. Currently, we hire people from Red Hook because we believe in investing in the community in which we serve. Operating a small business in Red Hook has become a challenge in the sense that it is difficult for staff to get to work on time. Given the location of Red Hook, it is difficult for community members to navigate the community due to the lack of public transportation. The neighborhood of Red Hook has so much more to offer its residents and visitors. The nearest train is between 15 to 25 minutes walk. One can say we all need the exercise. However, when the only option to, com to commute is within a 15 to 25 minute walk, that creates a burden, both on the residents and the employers in the community. And that's not okay. As Brooklyn Bar President Eric Adams puts it, there are communities now in this city, if we honestly admit that our prisoners because of the lack of public transportation within the communities itself and we don't want to be prisoners in the Red Hook community. The proposed BQX streetcar would be an added value to all in Red Hook, as it would offer an alternative form of transportation. Over the last 10 years, we have seen and an experienced tremendous growth, both in housing, jobs, and residents. Within this growth, we need to, to provide daily services that will provide you know, the enhancement that we've seen over the last 10 years, and that includes public transportation. 
being top of the list. Yes, there are renovations being done on the trains and the buses which service most of the communities within Brooklyn. However, communities like Red Hook has limited public transportation choices. One bus in and out, one train 15 minutes away. The BQX, the BQX would provide a needed relief to community, com community in and around the Red Hook area. The BQX will create more exposure to all the small restaurants like mine and businesses located along the proposed route of which my restaurant is also located. Essentially turning my storefront into a standard advertisement, Friends of BQX held an event on March 5th called BQX. Real impacts on local businesses, here is here we saw how small businesses from big cities around the country came to Brooklyn to talk to us about how the addition of the streetcar is worth it. They vocalized about how scary it was at first, just to think about the project itself and what it would, the impact that it would cause. But in the end, the final product showed that this would become more satisfying to the people within Queens and Brooklyn who would be serviced by the streetcar. Being a, and it would be a win-win for both the members and the small businesses. The BQX cr creates new areas for New Yorkers to explore between Brooklyn and Queens that are currently inaccessible without going through Manhattan first. Whether it's one seat ride for commuters coming in to dine or for an employee coming to work, the BQX offers a real solution that brings with it convenience and time saving. BQX has the ability to help residents of Red Hook work and play outside and within Red Hook itself. Every New Yorker should have a chance for better quality of life, and the BQX should do that for hundreds and thousands of communities who already live in these neighborhoods. As a owner of a business in Red Hook, since February, I must say my greatest challenge is employees getting into work because of the commute. Coming from Queens, coming from other parts of Brooklyn. And what that does, it limits qualified employ employees to gain employment within the Red Oak area. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jessica Ford and I am here on behalf of Nick DeFonte, owner of DeFonte Sandwich Shop. Hi, my name is Nick DeFonte and I'm a lifelong Red Hook resident and small business owner. I own and run DeFonte's Sandwich Shop and practically grew up in the place. My grandfather opened DeFonte's in 1922 and we've kept it in the family ever since. We are the epitome of what a neighborhood staple is. I have watched with a front row seat how Red Hook has changed over the years. Our family has seen what happens when our city doesn't welcome change. We watched as everyone fled from New York in the 1980s yet we stayed strong. Throughout it all, I have watched Red Hook suffer from lack of transportation. We know that Red Hook residents, on average, are 10 to 25 minutes away from a subway station. That is not okay. The closest subway to DeFonte's subway sandwich shop is a 16 minute walk away. The closest ferry is 11 minutes away. The BQX is proposed to run right by my shop, bringing with it a stop that will put DeFonte's within a five minute walk from public transportation. In addition, the BQX will bring an estimated 50,000 additional eyes on my business a day. On March 5th, friends of the BQX had other small business owners from big cities around the country come to Brooklyn to talk to us about how the addition of a streetcar is worth it. They spoke about their fears regarding construction, but also praised the addition of the streetcar for leading to increased foot traffic and revenue. This is a win-win. The BQX will open up new areas for New Yorkers to explore between Brooklyn and Queens that are virtually inaccessible to each other now. It will no longer seclude Red Hook from Queens and creates better, more reliable access to Northern Brooklyn. We deserve a real transportation solution that not only opens up new neighborhoods to Red Hook residents, but that can stand up to the weather as well. Currently, Red Hook is located on the floodplain and we need a form of transportation that is resilient from a hurricane. We saw in Texas after Hurricane Harvey that the light rail was up and running with just a day after the floodwaters receded. If we can continue to rely on state-run agencies to help us, we will be waiting forever. Seven years later, we are still waiting for a flood protection plan post Superstorm Sandy. Whether it be commuters coming to dine or an employee coming to work, the BQX offers a real solution. 
The BQX has the ability to help residents of Red Hill work and play outside of just their neighborhood. Every New Yorker should have a chance at a better quality of life, and the BQX can do that for the hundreds of thousands of commuters. Thank you. Thank you, and I especially enjoyed hearing from Red Hook as well. Uh, I think Red Hook has, has a, uh, a special story about every, a lot of the things we're talking about along the waterfront, and maybe not like a, unlike other waterfronts with the post-Sandy work, um, transportation desert, uh, a real transportation desert in a lot of ways. It's not just like connections, we, we, we need it. Uh, and, and making sure that our businesses can grow. And I, and I hear that big time. And I think get, getting that uh, understood and a handle on that has been, has been a struggle for us in trying to figure out what we can do. And, and I, get, I think maybe my only question to, to the, specifically to the Red Hook businesses, uh, to, both, to both Don and Jessica actually, um, this, is, this is a project that has a long time frame. So this is, this is 10 years from now and construction will happen, so you're gonna get impacted in some ways at DeFontes, and, and, and are we, are we kind of looking at that too? Because not only are you waiting for the, for the train, the light rail to come in 10 years, there's gonna be impact along the way, and what happens to DeFontes when there's construction in front of it for a while? And removal, so these are, the, these are real questions that we have to think about, because, because we have pieces of this already that are, are very important, like 55,000 people that are gonna ride it a day, or the 50,000, whatever it is. And, and so how do, we, how do we work backwards from that? And when we think about some of the transportation planning that's been happening in Red Hook, you look at things like a connector bus that does two or three stops in Red Hook and then goes right into the city, into the hub in city, in the city like on Fulton Center, where all the trains are at. And that's a way to get people to connect to Red Hook quickly with a bus. So there's other options that we can do, and I'm not saying no to the BQX. I have a lot of concerns, and I've been very clear about that. It's more, how do we get stuff now, today, to help your business now, to get your employees to your business today? That, that I think, is, is something we should additionally be looking at, and if people are, and we had so many folks here that wanted better transportation, how can we phase it in so that we have better transportation now and look for the future, whatever that future aspirational thing might be. It might be the BQX. It might be something else. But what do we need now? Because you need it now. I, I didn't hear you need it in 10 years. You need it now. Both of you yeah. need it now. And so that's, that's the only thing I'm gonna leave you with as your representative in, in Red Hook, that that's, that's how I'm looking at it, and I'm hoping that that's what you felt was happening here today. Okay, thank you. Uh, is anybody here wanting to testify that has not signed up? Just gonna do one last final flow, okay? Um, and as, as a closing thought, and I, maybe you kind of heard that was a little bit of a closing thought about what this oversight hearing is, and essentially this is the first time we've had a conversation with the city and the Friends of BQX was able to testify openly about what's happening, and a lot of good things came out of it, I think, and a lot of questions were answered. We're gonna keep asking these questions so that we can feed it back to you as residents, separate and apart from whatever organization you might be representing as just people in New York that can be helpful in making these decisions with us. Because as council members, eventually this is gonna turn into possibly a ULERP process. And those are really difficult sometimes because there's not a lot of transparency and you can read some of the stuff that we're doing in Sunset Park about more transparency in ULERP. But we don't want it to be that. We want it to have a. We want to have that information before we walk into that kind of discussion, so that we can make better decisions as communities. So we can be impacted positively, not negatively, with gentrification and displacement, not just for residents who are renters or homeowners, but um, businesses as well. So this is very complicated, and I'm really happy that we did this and we dedicated time to make that happen, and there were so many people here. So thank you for anyone who's organized to get people here. I think we all learned something, and let's just keep organizing. Businesses on your, on your block, in your neighborhood, let's keep engaging. And I just wanna thank the whole staff for your incredible work. Uh, you all did an amazing job of making today incredibly possible. Uh, there's a list that I need to read because you guys are all incredible. Um, first of all, Alex here, uh, Polinoff, the Legislative Policy, le sorry, Legislative Council to the BQX Task Force, uh, Emily Rooney, the Senior Legislative Policy Analyst, John Douglas, Senior Project Manager, 
uh, Emery De Dev, Assistant Director, Davis Winslow, the Senior Economist, my Chief of Staff, Soshi Meng, uh, and Renee Wittison, my Land Use Director, uh, who's been sitting to my left here, and all of you who came out today. Thank you all. Thank you. This hearing is now adjourned.